Friends, if you're looking for real old school laughs, you're in for a treat because we've got them right here. Flip City Magazine. Remember Mad Magazine? Then it went woke? Well, don't worry. Flip City has no chance of going woke. That's right. Four times a year, you'll get an actual printed magazine full of jokes, stories, comics, and more, all about today's pop culture, entertainment, and woke politics. Flip City takes terrible entertainment trends we love to hate with hilarious parodies of Lord of the Rings, Stranger Things, The Walking Dead, Star Trek, Hunters, and more. Trust me when I say there is nothing else like Flip City on the market. So subscribe today. It will be delivered in print, or you can even get it digitally if you're one of those wacky Zoomers. Either way, follow our link and sign up today, and if you put in midnight, you get an extra 10% off. Check out Flip City Magazine today. Greetings, everybody, and welcome to Midnight's Edge After Dark. How's everybody doing? Hey. Hopefully you're having a wonderful Tuesday. We have CC Karaoke coming in from the snowy Great White North. How are you doing? Doing all right. Blue skies, powder snow. Feeling good, if not a little bit tired from the skiing, but glad to be here. Pure. The snow is Pure. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's got some dog piss in it, but otherwise, yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't eat the yellow snow. Uh, uh, we also have Nick Weiser here. How you doing? That was a, I'm good. That was a great Frank Zappa reference you dropped there. But yeah. hello, uh, Tom, CC Scribe. Hello, Chat and Wrenches. Yeah, it's it's Tuesday. Um, it's not snowing over here, but it's still very Illinois in terms of its temperatures. But we got some Garfield trailer to talk about. Did this one debut uh, on a Monday like the previous one did? Uh, yes. All yeah. Right. In fact, we got a trailer and a couple clips, and we're going to get to that. Oh, we also got Scribbles with us. How are you doing, Scribe? I'm doing all right. Uh, I, I have no clever musical references to provide, unfortunately. Well, you'll come up Except I, I do have one music reference to provide, though, and that is Lorenzo Music, who was the first, as far as I'm concerned, and best Garfield voice. That's correct. Ever. Yeah. Rest in nice peace. touch. You know, at least they could have done is just okay. We're gonna get into that. Is that yeah. that? Yeah. Uh, in fact, let's start there. Why not? Hello, everybody out there in the chat. Let's say hello to you guys first, and then we'll get right into it because uh, no super chats yet. But I see Goddess of Wim hanging out. I see Jeremy Winfield, FKHC two thousand five. We got D Bud Martin number one here, swinging a wrench around, we're sharing out everybody's uh, links out there. Thank you for that, D Bud. We appreciate that. We got Otis here. We got uh, who else? SC is here. Nick the Greek, the other Nick is in the house. We got Red Midnight Batman. Ooh, oh, that sounds ooh. dark. Yeah, I feel redder. We have the Don Johnson here. <laughs> <laughs> really? That's a wow. great name, Don Johnson. Don Johnson of Miami Vice fame. <laughs> uh, we got Tornadoes here who says Garfield, cool. Mecca Jay's here swinging a wrench as well. Send Garfield. I hate Mondays set on a Tuesday. Yeah. Well, it's our Tuesday show owner. I don't know how much we're going to talk about this on like the morning show perhaps, but the, then I saw somebody in the chat. Jeremy earlier said, uh, John would have been, or uh, Chris Pratt would have been better as John. Uh, hold on to that thought because I think that's what we're all going to kind of say. But, uh, yeah, with that, uh, share out the link, let everybody know we're live, uh, uh, hit the like button. Cause we also have, Possible leaks from Coyote versus Acme. Oh, yeah. Whoa. Whoa. Also, there's another Final Destination movie coming out, and maybe we'll talk some other about some other stuff too. But let's get it right into this. We've got a trailer and a couple clips. We're definitely gonna watch the trailer. I don't know about the clips because those will probably get claimed for sure. But uh Sony's actually not too bad about trailers. Um, and we did get another Ghostbusters trailer too, but uh, 
didn't feel like there was a whole lot new in that one, but uh, uh, let, let, let's check this out though. Cause we've been, we've been talking about the Garfield movie since it's been uh, announced. And I'm, frankly, I'm, I'm kind of a Garfield fan. I always I kind of grew up Garfield. reading the books. I love the cartoon. Dude, the comics are yeah. fun. I read a lot of those when I was a kid, whether it was in the collected books I had or the. I was going to say, I think CC or somebody the... brought up the collectible books books before the little fat. Well, I, got, I, got, I, got, I got stacks yeah. of them back at, in Toronto. Yeah, the big fat <laughs> rectangles they have at the yep. uh, dentist's office or something. Yeah. He had like 30, 40, 50 of them, whatever it was, because he collected oh, them almost every year. Yeah. Yeah. They're great. But all right, let, let's check this new trailer out for Garfield. Wait here, Junior. I'll be right back. Oh. Oh. You hungry, Garfield? Let's get it. Good morning. You deserve to be seen with somebody as bright as me. We're gonna need the big scale. Does she need to announce it to the whole office? Say when? Never, John. Bury me in cheese. Mm-hmm. Life here is pretty near perfect. Little did I know, it was all about to collapse. <laughs> Odie, I'm dreaming again. Slap me across the face. I think this is a case of mistaken identity. You must be looking for another gorgeous, lovable kitty cat. Come on, Junior. <gasps> you. This is Vic, my father. Welcome back, Victor. <gasps> Listen, I need your help. Get them! <gasps> I haven't seen you for years, and when I do, you're on the run from a deranged cat. We need to toughen you up. Hey, I know tough, Vic. <laughs> You've obviously never been in an olive garden that's run out of breadsticks. Follow my lead. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, cheddar. Probably one of my top 26 favorite cheeses. Mm. My orange tabby and my dog are both missing. Your call is very important. There are 1,046 people ahead of you. Uh, Stop them now! We have to go save my dad. Oh, that cat's a goner. You think you can battle these villains on your own? If I don't make it back, tell my story. Hello, mama, you you heard about me. He wants to help him. No, this is how he learns. <laughs> All right. Well, there we go. There's the trailer for Garfield the movie. Uh, let's start with Scribe. What, what did you think of this trailer? I don't know if you saw the first trailer too, but uh, uh, this, I think I might have a while back, but I don't remember. Um, okay. So a couple things. First, I, I don't know that Garfield translates over to action comedy that well. Maybe that's just me. I, I don't know. It just doesn't quite seem seem appropriate to me. But the other thing too is that I, I'm sorry, Chris Pratt's voice just does not fit. It just doesn't fit. I, I you have to have something. I, I just can't get past the classic Lorenzo music or even the Bill Murray version, where it's like this sort of like bemused, underwhelmed kind of attitude. It, it Garfield's not poppy and catchy, and and chipper. It just it just doesn't fit. So. And plus the fact that I'm not that big on fully animated Pixar looking movies that try to make me laugh. And I don't laugh a single time during a trailer either. That doesn't help me. <laughs> I'm just a grouch. What can I tell you? <laughs> hmm. I wish I could say I'm big about this because there are aspects of this. I like, I like that. No, I recognize the characters, but yeah, it is kind of weird seeing Garfield be happy. Go lucky which is really not his uh, style. This should have been like a straight comedy, not a action comedy. I do agree in that. I don't mind the animation style as such. You know, it's bright and colorful. And once again, the characters are recognizable. That's great. Now that I've seen a second trailer, I can, you know, evaluate Chris Pratt more. I, he, you know what? I really do wish I could have seen him as John. I wish they could have just gotten an unknown to have had been Garfield. I think they could have made that work and had still had be still a big draw because people are like, oh, hey, prep for uh, John. I can see that. But now that you put that idea in my head, Tom, I can't not see that. But 
uh, you know, it's okay. I mean, I don't know if I will or won't see it. Maybe we'll see, but it looks, eh, it's all right. Right. CC. I don't mind the trailer. I mean, it looks fine, but I mean, I also have concerns, right? I mean, the final shot of this trailer and the previous trailer, I think was with the, the foofy Garfield, right? That whole scene with the hair dryer, it's pulled right out of the comics. Right. And they're going, they're going for a bigger story with his dad and all that stuff. I'm, and I, I don't, I'm willing to give that a shot, but at the same time, I think the movie would have worked perfectly well if they actually just pulled some of the best three panel strips from the comics over the years and put it together as a kind of series of unfortunate comedic events, because there are some pretty good ones. And yeah, you know, there's nothing particularly deep about Foofy Garfield, right? Uh, but I, 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 I will be entertained by that. Plus, it would probably work for the TikTok generation. Uh, oh, yeah. The other thing I noticed is they're not really showing much of John, like like John's voice. There's only a couple of brief clips where he speaks in this trailer. And I noticed he's like, John is, say say Garfield is, is kind of, you know, uh, yeah, he has, he has a, he's, he's not a high energy character. But neither's John, right? Mm-hmm. John especially is is pretty dour, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and that the, I I only heard a couple of seconds in the trailer of his voice, but that voice also did not sound to me like John. Now, granted, I need to hear more of him, but they're not showing us anything of him. It makes me wonder a little bit. So if if I can't picture John as being John, and I can't picture Garfield as being Garfield, you know. Um, that's going to take uh, me out of it. I wonder if I should I, show you that clip. I really wish like whoever gave the direction to the story to n- have these characters be the characters, because I don't really hold it against Pratt. I mean, I know there are some, definitely some legitimate opinions about it, having a voice to tell it, but it's not like he's <laughs> not capable of doing these things. Obviously anyone who watched the terminal is can see the man has more capabilities but well, that's what happens when you say, hey, we need you to do something different. And he actually adapted. So it's not like it's a Chris Pratt problem. Yes. I'm sure he has more capability, but it's clear that they, whoever's writing this is just having Chris Pratt be Chris Pratt, not having him be Garfield. Maybe they think they need that higher energy to be funny, but the whole, the, the low energy in the comic is, is really part of what gives yeah. it the punch right yeah but the yeah. low energy in the comic book is is a more sort of uh subdued mature type yeah uh situational oh, yeah. humor i mean this this movie's obviously aimed at kids so they can't it's, have things go slow they can't have the jokes go over the kids heads so they got to build it up with action I, and all this slapstick and stuff so i i understand why it's kind of like the live action movie was back in the day right like they yeah have that stupid adventure in it just for because to have a stupid adventure in a movie sake yeah um this, this I mean, is my reaction oh yeah sorry. Oh, go ahead. i was gonna say that the, uh, if if they wanted to do garfield like more pure to the garfield or, or you know source material it would make more sense as a series of shorts on netflix or something if they wanted to well, do that they're, they're doing a movie that they're aiming for kids it's like okay they got to do this stuff but it's not really garfield at that point it's pretty much name your pixar knockoff kids movie and that's but it's also got garfield in it i'm of two minds in this right because as a garfield fan i'm seeing a lot of stuff i like the characters the 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 the, the design is spot on sure yeah i like that design. Um, that's why i like, the, I like it's colorful world. it looks it good like world. it looks almost like the original 2d animation brought to 3d animated life without any real weird conversion to it oh and we also have clobby joining us Hey, hey, he makes it. Hey, sorry to be so late, my friend. Oh, you're fine. I don't know if you got a chance to watch the Garfield trailer yet, but we we're talking about that. But, I uh, have yeah. not. I've been gone all day, out on the road. Yeah. Well, we're gonna watch a clip here in just a minute too. Oh, we also oh, have Price boy. joining us late as well. <laughs> oh, hey, every, wow! Now it's a party. <laughs> now, here's hey, a man who guys? probably should have been doing the voice of Garfield if you don't have Lorenzo Music or Bill Murray, uh, Mr. Price of Reason. <laughs> you think I could have pulled it off? Yeah, I think. Oh, yes. 
Yes, you sound subdued and slightly irritated at everything. Just, just sounds sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> What I love about Garfield, and yeah, you kind of just brought this up, I think, Scribe, or maybe it was UCC, but just kind of how, like, you know, you guys were talking about how Garfield is always kind of more subdued, and John is kind of dour, too, in a way, but at the same time, he's somebody who's always trying to get himself out of whatever funk it is, or he he tries right. to look at the right side of other things, but Garfield always just seems to be that bit of his ego that's knocking him down or whatever okay. you know what and, I mean? that, and that's and that's what really comedy not comes talking from. to anybody that's the beauty of it i, I mean you kind of have garfield from two ways because one of my funniest things i've stumbled upon in years is somebody decided to go through garfield and take out all the thought bubbles <laughs> yes <laughs> what it yeah, it was like. funny. so what it looks like is basically john is a psychotic freak who does nothing yes. but talk to his cat yes <laughs> no, and but that that's the part that's missing from this is that it's it's the contrast between Garfield's dour sense of humor and an outlook on the world as compared to John's constant trying to cheer himself up and like I'm going to go out there and get him everybody likes me kind of stuff. But Chris Pratt, at least the performance Chris Pratt shows in the trailer, it's not that. It's like teenage Garfield, not world weary downtrodden yeah. by the mundanity of life Garfield, which is the Garfield that that's makes things funny. That's why I didn't hate the first Bill Murray movie. I no, I, no. I didn't hate it. It actually has a lot of Garfield moments, especially like when he's like leaving the house and he's like, okay, I think I've done enough walking for today. <laughs> he <goes Yeah>. back, <laughs> he's literally like, half, like just at the end of the, the walkway, let alone down the block. It's like, that's Garfield. Yep. He's not going to do anything that's going to disrupt his little, cul-de-sac life right like so that's kind of what the movie needs to be about is something is going to disrupt his life i think the movie should have been about i mean i don't mind it being about his dad because i think that's one thing that we have not explored because we met his mom before and i do like that he's at the mexican restaurant because that's where he was born in the original comics and stories mm -hmm. and i believe he does have brothers and sisters and stuff like that but i don't think we've ever met his father now, I don't like the idea of his dad being kind of like this deadbeat dad of sorts, but they kind of are setting up this thing that he's been on the run for a reason. He went like out for cigarettes. Story. Yeah, but like there's this mafia story involved. It's like with the cats and stuff. That's where it's kind of getting a little off the rails for me. But then again, it does sort of fit in Garfield's world, but you guys are right. It's kind of like the biggest problem I have is the characterization of Garfield. And it's mostly yeah. through the emotion of moding of the voices because I don't remember who was on the panel when the first trailer came out, but a couple days after that, somebody went and took AI and changed it to Lorenzo music's voice. Oh, and we all laughed our asses off at it. Cause it was brilliant. It was perfect. Everything was pitch perfect. And it was like, okay, that's Garfield. Like, I need to see like this. get behind this. Yeah. I'll, I'll see if I can find that in a minute, but I'm, I want to show this clip here real quick. Cause I think it was uh, you, Nick, who said you didn't, or was it CC? One of you didn't say you didn't get enough of John. Yeah. Well, this clip actually has a little bit more of John in it, but this is, this is an actual full on clip. So if this, if all of a sudden we jump when you're watching this on the replay, I had to cut this out. <laughs> so, okay. Whoa, you are a hungry little guy. So there, we got a little bit of John. I know that wasn't okay. much, but mm -hmm. yeah. there is one other clip if you guys want to see it, but it's just the Monday clip, I believe. Mm. I think I saw one. I mean, you can if you want. Even the even the mm. voice for John is not all that. Yeah, it's just, no, it feels like, like, it's it like it feels it doesn't sound like an adult. It doesn't sound like an adult man, and John does sound like an adult man. That sounds more like a early to mid twenties right. uh yeah. guy. It's he the voice of the next Lex Luthor. And I know I know when you're 18, you're considered an adult. Is that really Nicholas Holt does, playing him? Yeah, Nicholas Holt is the voice of John really? in this. Yeah. Oh, that doesn't I'm, fit at yeah, all. I know, yeah, no, I know he's no. older, but I, his voice is not. His voice sounds way too youthful for that character. 
It was something like 30 years ago, I was in school and we went on a field trip to Second City. It was a, a Toronto comedy troupe that uh, uh, Tom, I'm sure you probably know of. Oh, yeah. And what they, what I remember they, 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 they were telling us is the art of comedy is not knowing that you're funny, right? Uh, and I'm not getting that from this movie right now. It's like, you know, when, when Garfield's going back and forth between the trees, it's like, ha, 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 we, you know, he'll learn. It's, it's, it's. You know, everyone kind of knows they're being funny. Like John, even John is very kind of upbeat. Um, well, John is completely and, on not he's he's not self aware at all. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, but that's what I mean. But like when I think back to the comic comics, like one of, one of the the common jokes in the comic strips is is normal, right? And when and when John asks uh, where is where where's normal, he's 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 not like chipper about it he's he's pondering he's, he's kind of in a state of pondering he's like where, where's normal right and we say talk about taking garfield's speech bubbles out of the comic it, it works because that is the dynamic right john is talking to his cat but he can't hear garfield right right and and when garfield responds he's not like i sent normal to, to abu dhabi no he's like i sent her to abu dhabi right but not even with the energy i just delivered he just right. very 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 matter of fact right actually he but, would say something like this is a funny question john do you realize how much it costs to send something to abu dhabi yeah. now exactly yeah like that's the kind so of that, joke that, you that would, would put in now right yeah. like yeah. yeah would he still send him to abu dhabi or is that considered not politically correct <laughs> yeah, that's the other oh, problem yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah they'd probably just change it to timbuktu or something just to be you know, I, I was thinking about that with, with, with his dad too, right? They, they like, change it to Texas. Oh yeah. <laughs> his, his, I, I might, I might actually think of his dad as being somebody who's kind of like gets around, you know? Uh, well, yeah. And I mean, that's, you know, the Tomcat and around kind of thing, whatever. Yeah. But, uh, okay. Here's the Monday clip. Just so you guys, I'm I'm assuming this is going to be one of the clips that starts off the movie and Garfield will probably quickly run us through his life story. That's probably where the lasagna scene and all that stuff come in, but I'm just guessing uh, I'm kind of just putting the movie together in my head already, but yeah. time to go to the vet. <laughs> We're going to need the big scale. Does she need to announce it to the whole office? <gasps> <laughs> yeah, that's about the only time you see Garfield animated is if there's a spider. <laughs> <laughs> you know what would be better? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I was going to say, you know, it'd be better if, if they didn't have Garfield's mouth move when he talked. Like yeah, that, 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 cool. that, that, that freaks me out. That kind of makes my brain go, it wait, what? weird. And they did the yeah. same thing in the Bill Murray one, and I didn't like that. Yeah. 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 I because he never talked in the old cartoon like that. You know, maybe they just don't. Odie is perfect, though. Like everything I've seen of Odie, though, I fucking love. Like they yeah, nailed yeah. Odie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, that's and I like this shot. That that is Garfield. That's in like, shot. That, yeah, that oh, shot straight right out of the there. comics. Yeah, if you saw this as a still. You're thinking, oh, that's perfect because Garfield's in a position he doesn't want to be in. He looks absolutely mad, and Odie's kind of like, oh no, we're gonna, we're in trouble from John type of face. This on the surface, we're like, oh, this looks like this is gonna be good, but then you watch the trailer and reality sinks in. They, they probably were playing this safe, right? That's why they had Garfield's mouth move, because it was like, well, all right, well, it'll be confusing for the audience if his mouth isn't moving. And it's like, well, yeah, okay, but you start making those concessions to add up. It, yeah. And I, I get why you want to consider kids for the attention span, but... And that's why we should go from Sunday to Tuesday. See, I that, like that too. I, mean, I like that. That, that was the closest work. they came to his to his. But to it his still attitude. doesn't work, right? Like, no, it's it still doesn't. not quite Garfield. It just sounds like... Yeah. Great. Garfield doesn't sound angry. Garfield is very like, I could give a fuck. <laughs> he's bemused. Yeah. He's, he's bemused at the world. And that's why Bill Murray works so perfectly besides just the whole, you know, obviously paying tribute to Lorenzo Music, who did his voice for, Gar you know, yeah. it all just seemed to work out. And Bill Murray was just a perfect Garfield voice. Now, now Price and Klobby, you just coming in here and seeing this. I just want to grab your guys' opinions on this. Before we watch this older version of the other trailer with Lorenzo, Lorenzo Music's voice. Oh, here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No yeah. Price? I haven't seen this. Price, you want to go first? Anything so far on that clip or anything you saw so far? 
Oh, on which one of the things on the on the? Or how do you feel about well? Garfield? Yeah, and in the trailer that dropped yesterday, I don't know if you got to see it yet. Yeah, I, I've I've watched them. The thing is, is that uh, I I tend to agree with what's being said here. As a kid, I understood why he wasn't moving his mouth, and I also I was familiar with those comics and with the books. They had those kind of rectangle books that had so many of the comic strips in them. So I was really familiar with that as a kid, and when I saw the the animated one. I understood why he wasn't moving his mouth. It feels like they're trying to dumb it down for this kind of uh, new audience because they don't think they're smart enough to understand that the cat is thinking thoughts and, you know, it, they're making him move his mouth. But I, I, if you ask me, I don't even like the visuals that much. I, I like the way it looked in the past with that kind of 2D animation. This kind of whatever they're doing here, I don't like it. It looks like a video game of sorts. If All that right, makes any enough. sense. Yeah, no, I get what you're saying. But I can't believe I didn't think of this sooner. Stephen Wright should be doing the voice of Garfield. Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah. What, what is Stephen like, Wright doing right now? Anybody should have took it over afterwards. It's like, oh, yeah, Stephen Wright. Just, just yeah, is he is Stephen? Garfield. <laughs> what is Stephen Wright doing now, anyway? I, mean, I don't he, Just voice where he does whatever. Like, but he, like, he is such Garfield. Like, Odie, get away from me. I don't want to deal with your crap today. <laughs> That's just, that is such a, anyway, you're Clobby. What's your thoughts so far? I'm right there with, with price. I'm absolutely immediately turned off by the, I don't buy this animation style for someone else, but for Garfield and have his, you know, him talking like that, something, you know, thinking stuff as someone, you're, you're, if you're into this, you know, the strip at all, and I haven't even looked at a Garfield strip in years, but you know, I respect Tim Davis and that strip and the popularity of it. And, it just doesn't really make me feel like I'm watching Garfield. This is a pastiche of, with a lot of weird takes, and I, you know, I don't, I can't get into it. It's real tough. But I haven't seen this other trailer. I haven't seen the other trailer. I so saw just what you were just showing here, okay. and I saw a trailer right. a while back of maybe. But. Well, we're gonna watch that earlier trailer right now, actually. Okay. Um, and this is the, but this is Lorenzo music dub, as it's been called. Mm. Yeah, and I even looked it up. Stephen Wright is like half Italian, so <laughs> perfect. <laughs> oh wow! There you go. It's like he looks Italian. I wonder. Yeah, his mom was Italian. Anyway, all right. Let's. Uh, let, this is. The, I showed this before, guys. This is amazing. Somebody went and took AI and redubbed Garfield's voice with Lorenzo music. It's like um, this is one of those points where I'm almost like, okay, if you didn't get Stephen Wright, why don't just do something like this? Even though you'd have to have his uh, Lorenzo music's uh, family sign off on it, but still kind of stuff. Yeah. But yeah, as you can see, it kind of changes. I mean, outside of the slapsticky crap, which still doesn't work. No. Well, I mean, the voice parts to me felt like they worked, especially I've never jumped in my life. That was the best <laughs> like, one. Yeah, that was yeah. the best. Yeah. <laughs> that felt Garfieldy with, a, and the voice yeah. is a little too fast. But other than that, like, yeah. Well, because the, the AI is not going to actually change the inflection; it's just going to change the tone, yeah. right? So it's still Chris Pratt's delivery. So it's not quite right for yeah. that reason. But you but see the does, big improvement, right? It, like, yeah, it does sound more like it should, mm -hmm. but it, it still has that that kind of more upbeat kind of yeah uh, yeah garfield's whole timbre is very low and monotone uh, most of the time and doesn't really lot you know i i don't just look i don't dislike chris pratt and most of the most of the things that he's in i no, have he's no just issue miscast with. yeah yes i just don't think he's right they they did mario with him and that was probably the most you can push him I think that I think Garfield, he was miscast in that. I was I was the unpopular opinion on that one too. I think he was miscast in that too, but that one they could somehow get away with. Whereas Garfield, I feel like they took it a step too far. True. One, I, yeah, I was I, I I even though I I agree with Price, he's not my defend Mario voice, but he was passable. I still I still how do you not get movie. Danny DeVito though? Of all these, <laughs> yeah, that like, been come nice. on, he is Mario. Mario. This, Chris I, Pratt I, could I do it with the right direction. If Chris Pratt had the right voice direction, well, no, he, he was told too young for Mario. That was my other point. No, not for Mario. Sorry, I'm, I'm done with Garfield. Oh, Garfield with the right I direction. Maybe, Mario now. No. He might. Maybe. That's a thing we don't know. Like people yeah. so say, now that uh, I've thought Pratt about Stephen Wright, though, like I'm sitting here going, why had, didn't you just get him the moment? Because he's not a name. Not. Nobody would know who he is. Who cares? It doesn't yeah. matter. It's just that he is the voice. Nobody knew who Lorenzo Music was either. They just knew the voice. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's where I'm at. Like, okay, that just was like, that's the perfect person you pick now to take kind of like when they had um, Matthew Lillard for the last 20 years until recently play Shaggy, not just in physical form, but in the audio form too. I don't know if people knew that. No, 
they probably couldn't get funding for the film without Chris Pratt's name being attached. That's he could have played John. Too. And that's what it was. Well, like, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, sure enough. He could have played John. He could have played John. Yes, he, he should have been John. John. But John's not going to be in this movie that much. As we can see, he eventually goes out on the road away from John. John's going to be And that's a the mistake of it being thing. a road yeah. movie. This movie should be, and yeah. this is what I hold against the first movie, more so than anything, is that they don't tell the story of Odie correctly. They get it completely wrong in that movie, and I don't know how they got it wrong, because any true Garfield fan knows how John got Odie, because it's a trivia question. John used to have a roommate. And his roommate just up and left and left Odie there. So it's not even John's dog. He just left Odie there. <laughs> I think his name was Lamont or something like that. <laughs> like he used to be in the comics and then he just disappeared. Yep. Lamont. And they made a joke. Uh, Lamont, that's it. And they made a joke about it years later by Lamont <laughs> Lyman. That's what it was. Lyman. Oh, Lyman. Lyman. Right, right, right. Yes. Lyman. His roommate Lyman. Yes. And so, like, they should have had this whole thing where that's what it was, was like, John and Garfield are living their perfect life together, just like they were. And then all of a sudden Lyman needs a place to crash for a while. And he's got this stupid stinky dog named Odie and Garfield can't stand him. But then all of a sudden Lyman just fucking disappears. And that's what John's doing through the rest of the movie. He's trying to figure out what the hell happened to Lyman while Garfield's still <laughs> dealing with Odie. Right. I mean, there, there's your road adventure. They're just being drug along by John. Right. That would make more sense. These guys. And that's what I didn't like about the second half of the first original film is putting Garfield and them guys into their own adventure. Then it became toy story because it was basically John Garfield getting Odie back. Right. Like, 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 uh, uh, what's his face? Uh, Woody had to get to uh, buzz back. Remember? So it's like yeah. the same fucking story again. It's like, Oh, why is that the story? It should have been them just drug along on this adventure. They didn't want to be on that actually happened nine times out of 10. in most of the shows, there's the famous camping episode and stuff like that, where John's dragging Odie and, and Gar Garfield don't want to fucking go. Right? Like, <laughs> like he don't want to go out in the wilderness to him that's worst thing ever see that to me is garfield you gotta you gotta kind of put him in an adventure he does not want to be in i like the idea of him meeting his dad but then again it's not that important and i i fear this deadbeat dad problem with it so i'm not trying to overanalyze this but i guess like it's really weird that i am this big of a garfield fan and i know that much about the history of the character but uh I mean, just growing up, he was just one of the first cartoons that I really remember attaching myself to. So, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Anybody else got anything to say about Garfield before we move into super chats here? Yep, Let's Garfield in the rough. Ahead. That's the one. They even had a special oh, yeah. one too. Yeah, make me want to watch old Garfield episodes now. Get my dig out. They're my on Garfield most of them book. are on YouTube. I got yeah. my, I got my DVDs up here of holiday classics oh, and Garfield as itself dude, and stuff Garfield like that. Christmas. Yeah. Oh, I love the Garfield. Christmas. Oh, that's a classic. Yeah. I like the special. Pirates one. I got to show oh, that yeah. to my kids. The Pirates is the, the best Garfield one. Halloween special. That was the first yeah. one, actually. Love that one. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of scared the shit out of me as a kid. That's why, that's why I, I loved it. it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, with those fucking uh, ghosts and shit. It's like the fog and shit. It's like yeah, it ripped right well out of the made. fog. <laughs> and with the old man that talks to them and they're kind of scared, it, they really managed to create a little spooky adventure there. It is one of the best ones. And the Thanksgiving one's okay, but the Christmas one is really touching. I love that A, Odie makes Garfield the, the back scratching thing. And then Garfield finds those pictures for Grandma. Those two bits right there are just that make that whole special very sweet and special. And yeah, and then the, the, Har the Garfield Halloween one is just classic. I watch it every year still this day. That's one I never miss. But uh, yeah, let's see what you guys are saying out there in the chat. Uh, let's see here. We have. Uh, let me get to the Garfield one specifically. We're going to come back around to some of the other stuff here because they may be topics for later. Let's say uh, Jason Webster says the only thing. I think it means only thing that would really rankle Garfield would be served cold lasagna. <laughs> oh, there's quite a few things that would rankle Garfield. <laughs> but otherwise, he just pretty much doesn't give a shit as long as it doesn't affect his naps. And then we got Nick the Greek who says, at least <laughs> they didn't swap Ginger Garfield for BIPOC. Well, his dad's technically, but uh, mm. just voice wise, but I don't mind that. Yeah, I can look past that for the voice. Yeah, Samuel Jackson's. Fine. I mean, we we do have a lady who plays Bart, so I and she works as Bart, so I don't really care. How for how much longer? Who knows? 
<sighs> no, she'll get the pass because you're you're taking the woman out of the the the, the role <laughs> of an iconic character. So the, yeah. the the rule will change when it's inconvenient. Yeah. Well, then we got uh, Kyver Dam. I think is Keeper how you Dam. say that. Kyver Dam. Great name. Send in a little old lady super sticker, a purple lady. Thank you for that. We appreciate that. Uh, let's see here. We've got also uh, Truth, Hope, Love, who says, how do you feel about the memes that make Garfield into an eldritch demon? Also, <laughs> what about the edits that Garfield and Odie all together take that out, that take out older. Okay. I have not seen the eldritch demon one. And I, the one with that takes out Odie and Garfield all together is just kind of like taking the joke a step too far. <laughs> it's yeah. like, yeah, it's funny when he's just kind of talking to himself. It sounds psychotic, but when you take them out of the picture all together, it's just kind of like beating the, beating the joke into the ground a little bit. At first I got a chuckle out of it, but yeah, I don't know if you guys are, they also have a version where they've just taken them out altogether. So it's John just literally talking to nobody. Like he's, completely psychotic and crazy i think it's called garfield minus garfield or something something like that yeah yeah I mean, yeah i've seen that one yeah is garfield's stuff still there like his bowl his bed because then that, that would be tragic I, like the cat died and john is still talking. i'm trying to remember <laughs> now it's been so long that's a good point cc i don't remember now <laughs> i think i think so but i'm not sure because i think just Odie and garfield are removed that's it yeah <laughs> I think so. But anyway, Jason Webster sends in another uh, Australian five dollars. Thank you so much for the five dollar reduce. He says, I grew up reading Asterix, Garfield, the Pink Panther, Doonesbury, and think, thanks to my late father, Foot Rot Flats. Did they actually do a, a comic strip of the Pink Panther? I didn't know that. Uh, at one point, yeah. Must have. I, I yes. thought it was just a cartoon. Well, you would know, Clobby. Not necessarily. Well, but when it comes to that. comic, when it comes to comic stuff, I trust you. I will thank you. No more Tom knows. There you go, Jason. Oh. You got us to use that. Mm -hmm. uh, then we got uh, God is a whim. Holy crap. Holy sending in $20. Thank you so wow. much. Big spender. So it's Chris Pat Pratt. Uh, that's all, folks. Uh, Chris Pratt can't act with his voice. I can't argue that point. God, after Mario in this, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of like he was one of the weakest points of Mario. Every character he voices sounds exactly the same. Agreed. The audience can't see can't see you. You have to emote with your voice. Please, Chris Pratt, get voice acting lessons. I'll stop now. I no, think I, it's the I direction. You. It's the direction. You may be right, but I, th I, th I think if I think of the I think of the voice director says, "Okay, give me your best Lorenzo music to Chris." The only Pratt. problem is you get something good out of it. I think you would, but I don't think they want that. I think they need a recognizable Chris Pratt. They want to recreate the success of Mario, and they think that part of that was it's Chris Pratt as the character. So, well, here's my question though, then to you: Name me one movie where he hasn't pretty much just played Chris Pratt in said movie. Terminal List. Okay, I have not seen Terminal List, so I'll give you okay, that. Okay, well, dude, you Other haven't seen Terminal that, List? Dang, no, I haven't. pretty good. It's, and I like Terminal Chris Pratt, but the thing is with Chris Pratt is he's Chris Pratt and everything. Jurassic Park, he's just Chris Pratt and Jurassic Park. Uh, Zero I Dark mean, Thirty. Chris Zero, Zero Dark Thirty was kind of—I mean, he was kind of proto terminal list in that. But yeah, most other things. There's a Chris little Pratt bit of that. Wanted though, it's like. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. I, I'm not going to deny that one. No, early Chris Pratt and a lot of Chris Pratt. It is just you're hiring Chris Pratt, kind of thing. He, he has some range. If you see Terminal List, you'll know what we're talking about. I'll have now. to check he, that out. He, he, it great. seemed like he made a very special effort effort in Terminal List, and it wasn't bad. But he—that's yeah. sort of an anomaly. Most of the time, Tom is right. Most of the time, he's just Chris Pratt. Well, mm. voice acting is a different kind of acting. Goddess of Women is right here. Yeah. You can have, yeah, sure. like, look, I love Sylvester Stallone, but outside of King Shark, anytime he's done a voice, he's just Sylvester Stallone. Like, he's done Ants and a couple other cartoons, and it's just, he just comes in and does his voice, you know? Like, mm. King Shark was the closest thing to him acting, but that was just because he was having, obviously, so much fun just playing, like, that empty-headedness of it, like, the, the dumbbell. So it was, like, a very dumb version of Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> and, and stuff like that it's just like he just has to say <laughs> you know words just random words right like so it's kind of like Groot it's the same kind of joke but anyway um 
No, I, I, I see what you're saying, Scribe. I can see that he can act. I, I don't I never said he could act per se. But I'm just not so sure on the voice acting thing yet. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I'll give him I'll give him a point on Mario that he probably couldn't go into the stereotypical Italian mm-hmm. voice as much as he probably wanted to. Because you could tell he's trying to do it without doing it. And it's kind of this weird yeah. tightrope walk. But well, uh, I'd just be really curious to know uh, what directions he was given in the recording studio, first and foremost. Because if they wanted Chris Pratt to just be Chris Pratt, then he doesn't have to work that hard. If they didn't give him any, uh, you know, sort of barriers in which or some notes on how to do the voice, then he would just do what he do. So that's yeah, that's what I was saying earlier, Scribe. I would like to know what what was being told to him because we've seen what he can do when given mm. different material on an acting level. And I, I don't want to say he's a one note pony one, sorry, one trick pony based off of the voice acting, but given what we've seen, I can't blame anyone for thinking that, but I'd like to see what it would be like if he had to really try something different. Cause other than that though, he, him being Chris Pratt does not work for the character. Yeah, I agree. No, I agree with you, uh, Goddess, on this for the most part. Scribe could be right on some of it, but I have yet to see it, like Nick said. And you know what? The creator never wants to see one either, so I think you'll get your wish. Although I think somebody on the internet did do a really touching little short animation thing for Calvin and Hobbes, and it was really good, but it's been didn't a while. Did Bill Watterson say that? He didn't want to yeah, he does not, he's not somebody who likes to license things out or any of that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. No. He's been offered tons of money to oh, do yeah. a, a Calvin and Hobbes cartoons or specials and stuff over the years. And he's turned them all down. God bless him. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I wouldn't have had the fortitude. No way. Especially if I would have like been caught at some weak point. <clears throat> like, yeah, yeah, I'd have been totally screwed. Jason Webster sends in an Australian five says, if you anger Garfield, you'll eat your lasagna with fava beans and a nice bottle of Chianti. He might. <laughs> Penny has been here for two months. Thank you. Says uh, y'all love show or hugs y'all love the show. I'll be sixty three on the seventh. Holy crap! Whoa. No way. All right, my mom's birthday. Oh really? Yeah, well, that's cool. But she will be a lot older than that. So you're you're very young, Penny. Wow. There you go. And uh, yeah, well, you'll have to pop in on the seventh, and we'll have Bat Tom uh, say hey. Merry Birthmas. In advance, birth yeah, I really. like that. Uh, speaking of Garfield Nine Lives, it's a uh, one that's on, uh, I think is himself, if I'm not mistaken. Truth Hope Love says, Seeing Garfield Nine Lives, I think it's called, and the one that had the Watership Down style sequence. Yeah, that one's a trippy one. That mm-hmm. one has a bunch of different animation styles and stuff mixed into it. I, I recommend that one. It's, it's a good episode, though, or a good special, or whatever you want to call it. You got the noir bit in it, too. That was pretty cool. Um, and then we got Tommy reviews in the house who sends in 10 bucks says, I'm happy they are making Garfield, but I agree with the criticisms. My sister, sister and I are taking my mom to go see it. We watched Garfield all the time as kids with her. Also Garfield Halloween is great. I agree. And you know what? I might take my mom to that. I think she'd enjoy it. And then we've got Jeremy Winfield who sends in five and says, are you guys going to talk about that document? Nelson Peltz just released. What I want to know is how long Iger has had it on his desk. Okay, Jeremy, I think this is going to be a big topic for the morning show because we also have the uh, the call in the morning too that I think we're going to cover as well live. So this will probably be talked about more tomorrow. I have not had a chance to even look at it. Andre, I believe, has had a chance to go through some of it, but not all of it. I'm sure he's planning a video on it. But yeah, what he's talking about here is this 130-page uh, document that Nelson Peltz has released that Bob Iger has had in his possession for a while that basically are all his proposals to fix Disney and what's wrong with Disney and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, so he made it public as he has in the past when uh, these people don't take him seriously on these kind of things. And uh, yeah, so uh, we're going to probably dive into that much deeper on other podcasts. Midnight's Edge After Dark, we kind of try and keep it just a little bit more lighter. Uh, But uh, yeah, and not to cross over too many stories as well. (laughs) That's the other problem that can be difficult sometimes. Sure. Um, Red Midnight Batman sends in two Canadian buckaroos and says, have you seen the trailer for bike riders? I've not seen the trailer yet, but I did see some images of uh, what's his face from uh, Boondock Saints and uh, Walking Dead. Uh, just I've seen the trailer. Which kind of reminds me. Uh, well, kind of, well, I mean, it, uh, 
honestly, it kind of reminds me of like an old school, um, uh, not, well, not trailer park. What am I thinking? The drive-in sort of like biker, you know, like drama the exploitation movie. kind of movie. Yeah, a little, like a a little house, bit. I, yeah, I mean, it, it's, a bit, it's yeah, it's it's a bit more. It's not quite that bad, but it is. It is more like it feels a lot more rough around the edges, and it feels more. Yeah, old school, I guess is the best way to put it. And it, look, and it looks like it had a whole bunch of like backstory on its release or who was going to be distributing it or something. There's some drama that went on behind the scenes with delaying it because it was supposed to, I saw the trailer for it months and months and months and months ago. And only now is it starting to have a release date, I guess. So there's, there's some story there that I'm forgetting that I saw a blurb of somewhere. Yeah, I think I saw that trailer the other day at the theater. Well, can't remember all those 50 trailers I saw, but yeah. I think that was one of them. Norman Reedus, that's the guy's name I couldn't think that's of. That's right. Norman Reedus. And I just thought of that just came to my head. Because my buddy met him once. But anyway. Um, yeah, I haven't seen the trailer yet, but uh I've heard some interesting things about it. Maybe it'll be fun. I, I like what uh Scribe is describing. So anybody else here seen it or aware of it or anything? I, I thought I saw yeah, an yeah, ad yeah. or something. What is it? What what is this bike riders? It's uh, a like fiction. It's, it's a it's a fictional, uh, or it's it's it, it's about a fictional biker gang in I think the late '60s or something that's inspired by some kind of photo essay or something that was just like a story built up around a, a fictional biker gang. So it's a movie, and has it been released already? No, uh, it's no, yet. it's coming. It's got Austin Butler, Tom Hardy, Norman Reedus. Yeah, it hit the. Uh, okay, uh, I got it now. Yeah, I hit one of the festival circuits, like, I think last year or something. Probably and then trying I, to get to, like, that, uh, um, what was that? What's that biker show that came out a few years back? I can't think of. Sons of Anarchy. Kind yeah, of like something like in between that. that. And I think it's also based on the pictorial that also kind of inspired Easy Rider, if I'm not mistaken. Perhaps yeah. or something. But, to do but with they, that. Again, there was, there was some studio drama about its distribution. It got held up for some reason. Yeah. I forget exactly what it was. Yeah, because I think it was shot a couple of years back, wasn't it? Yeah, it's, it's not. It's not brand new. It's actually been sitting on, effectively sitting on the shelf for a couple of years. Anytime they need somebody with a motorcycle, they bring in Norman Reedus and yeah. his range, his acting range is, is that he can sit on a motorcycle and make a serious face. I do think he could make an interesting ghost rider. Oh. And a lot of people have been wanting that. him for a while. Uh, Donnie, or, Donnie or Danny? I don't know. It'd have to be Johnny. Johnny. I was going to say too Don, Danny, Danny. He's too old for well, Danny. He's too old for Danny Cash. You think so? Well, maybe. I was going to say kind of a different version. Doesn't necessarily have to be the uh, stunt driving version of it, but. I mean, yeah, but can I you imagine know. him dying, dying his hair red to make it fit the comic character? <sighs> yeah. You think so? All right. He's getting a little old now. That's the problem. You're both uh, on all accounts. I'm yeah. Remember when Nicholas Cage tried playing 10 him years ago? Yeah. 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 He tried yeah, playing, yeah uh, Nicholas Cage. He tried playing a 20 something yeah. Johnny. 28 year old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, and then he died. I'm like 22. <laughs> Don't mind the crow's feet. <laughs> <laughs> I would. I swear to God. I rewatched that with my girlfriend. We were at, uh, we went to my friend's wedding. I say we we're at the hotel killing time. I'm like, oh, we should watch this just to see how what to say. Did it so ridiculous? Let's see him with dyed black hair, which is obvious. It was dyed, and the fact that he's playing a twenty. That was my real hair. <laughs> In fact, I set my head on fire. <laughs> Love that. I'm a method actor. <laughs> oh man, I could never get enough of your dick peas. <laughs> <laughs> Killing me, man. <laughs> like we did a stunt, man. I'm like, for what? <laughs> I'm right here. <laughs> you might die. <laughs> oh, yeah. Fucking tickets. If they, if, if they remake Suburban Commando, they should cast him as the Christopher Lloyd character. Yeah. Oh. I was frozen today. <laughs> Had to toe, <laughs> couldn't feel anything except for cold. <laughs> I can't I'm sorry you felt cold today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'll get over it, but it's just it's like brain freeze times 10. <laughs> oh my god, you're killing me. What is brain freeze? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh 
Holy uh, crap. I forgot. I'm Nick, alive. The Greek, Nick the Greek has a great question. Uh, hello, panel. Looking forward to a show, by the way. What happened to 4K for you streams? Okay. It's scheduling has been a major issue with all parties involved. Uh, it is something I've been juggling, trying to figure out what works for Valiant, uh, Greg, trying to get either Robert or Bill on more regularly, Bill Hunt of the Digital Bits or Robert Meyer Burnett. And just those things in Valiant, he gets, he's gotten so big lately and so busy that I'm, I'm not even, I'm not picking on him or anything like that. I'm serious. Like I, I understand what he's going through. He just, his schedule has gotten so swamped with trying to keep up with his channel and his family life. So that alone has been difficult for me to kind of find a time with him that works for everybody. And so we're working on it. In fact, I'm supposed to talk to bill this week about the whole Disney Sony thing. So I've, I've been in touch with him. I almost nearly every day I talk to him as it is, but he's tough also to pin down. So, and Robert again, another one. So me and Greg could do it more often probably. Um, but, uh, I'd like to have at least uh, a couple other people there. Like I like Valiant there for his insight on just the technical stuff and so on and so forth. So yeah, we'll see what we can come up with here. I do want to get to something soon. Even if it's some pre-recorded stuff with bill, there will be something before too long. I promise. Uh, I really shouldn't promise, but <laughs> I just did. So, uh, then we got SFX, X, SFX, F314 saber tooth Raptor. Who's been a member for four, four months. And I can't talk. Do you all think Warner will get their hands on the rights to star Trek? Possibly TMNT. Paramount is not too long for the world. I like turtles too. I like turtles. <laughs> well, it's funny. You asked me this SFX saber tooth Raptor. Um, the rumors that Warner brothers is back in talks again with Paramount are starting to pop up again. As I had said that, I think the only reason they ended in the first place is because they legally couldn't go any farther than they already had at that point. Um, Cause now this month they are legally able now to do a merger or a sale of some sort. And I've been hearing that they have been very interested in some things over at Paramount and or Paramount and altogether again and all that kind of sort of thing. So I don't know for sure. Just take it with a grain of salt. You never know. I think Warner Brothers would handle both properties much better. What do you guys think? Let's start with Clobby since you're the the Trek spurt. Sorry, I got caught eating something. No, no, you're fine, brother. Really. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. I snuck one time like you do. Yeah. I um, do. well, I do believe that Warner would handle it better, but I don't think that they I don't think it's gonna that's gonna come to that. They would they, you know, I couldn't be that lucky. Not that Warner's perfect or anything, but getting it away from CBS or Paramount Pig chores would be a dream come true, but it just they've never let it go before. There've been so many rumors all over the years how they were going to lose Trek and they didn't. Uh, they're just going to they're just going to suck it dry. Now again, also I also like Turtles, but uh, Tom likes Mutant Ninja Turtles. I like Gamera. That's my turtle. Gamera is okay. Uh, yeah, I know. I, you're right. Tur Teenage Mutant Turtles are way better. He's no but... ninja, though. No, he's no ninja. Well, <laughs> hey, he's no ninja, but he can fight some kaiju now. He can do some flips and stuff. You're right. Yeah, he does flips and stuff, man. Yeah. He flies. Yeah, that's true. So I haven't now, seen one of the, his movies in a while. Did you, did you ever see those ones from the 90s that had like, big budget by that stand I've standards? seen I've seen clips from them, but I've never actually watched them. They're kind of cool. I've good. heard the other. They're decent enough. And if you saw that, you would like Turtles even more. I yeah. dare say. I hope so. so. Sorry for the ridiculously glib answer. No, you're fine. Something. Price, anything uh, you think that Star Trek or TMNT would do better over at the Warner than they are at Paramount right now? I mean, they couldn't be any worse than what we've seen. So, I mean, there could be some improvement, but. It, it really matters if there would be a, a willingness to do a serious creative cha change in both of these properties. If, if Zaslav understands that they've ruined these properties, Paramount, and that let's say he took over and wanted to do something different and appoint different people, maybe there's a chance to do something. I mean, in, in Turtles' case, I think it's easier. If they suddenly make a good Turtles movie, I think people would be happy. Whereas uh, Star Trek seems to be something more difficult to repair because they've done so much damage. So I think that that would be more complicated. 
Yeah. Nick? Hmm. I have nothing to add about Star Trek because, well, we once gave a historical confession, I think, here on here a few months ago. You're not a big fan or you've never really seen it? I've never watched it. Well, do you like turtles? You do like turtles, I hope. I do love turtles. I love my TMNT. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I... I, I I I'm gonna need enough time to pass before I can decide how DC is handled. Before I think, okay, maybe they'll do over at the turtles. I mean, the turtles aren't damaged like in a point where it's like, oh, this is damaged beyond repair. There's been some missteps. Obviously, like the rise shows awful. Seth Rogen's uh, movie with the Spider Verse like animations are good. It's no, it's really dumb stuff, but it's nothing where it's like damaging, like like the way let's just say like Star Trek Picard was. Even though I've not watched Picard, I've watched enough videos from it and I've heard en- enough of of opinions that I was like, okay, I can tell this was a just something that was just bad. This is something that wrecked like tons of continuity. TMNT hasn't had that bad of a huh, dark fate, if you will. They've had some ups on the air, too. Well, well, there is some bad things that have come out. There's been some good stuff, like the last Ronin comic was absolutely killer, and I actually really enjoy the Saturday Morning Adventures comic monthly, which is based off the 80s cartoon, if you will. So there is some good call. Also, the reissues yeah. of the year. So there is some good things coming out to balance out the bad a little where it seems like Star Trek is just in a really damaged place. So all I know is Warner Bros. would at least have a lot less of an uphill battle if they were to acquire those rights. But I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. And unfortunately, IDW retained the rights for another several years. So, yeah, it's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I still like turtles. turtles. Yeah, turtles Mm -hmm. would be. I still love turtles. I like turtles. I was just trying to get Tom to play that again. Oh, yeah. No, we, I'll always let that good play. But, yeah, those are not in as bad shape. So Warner Bros. would have to do the damage themselves to make them damage beyond repair the way, the way Trek is. Um, well, at least from what it sounds like, presumably speaking, that Trek sounds like it's damage beyond repair. You guys probably, well, be probably. the proper judge of that. But from what it yeah. sounds like, you've got, you got to chuck everything in the garbage if, you, if they did get it. And everything that had been done since 2009, all that's got to be forgotten if to start over to fix it they won't do that yeah trek is in a much worse shape i can agree with you there cc what about you if you want to save star trek you do what they should have done 10 years ago star trek had one of the most robust fan film cultures ever mm. i mean yeah. it got to the point where where fan films could have and were getting they, they were getting to be better than anything paramount could have made themselves officially and now maybe maybe they were you know threatened by that but that that was the wrong way to go you have all these super fans of this of this ip who know the the lore inside and out they know the rules they've read every piece of literature they've seen every episode multiple times they've created they've recreated the sets with the exact same paint that they used in the 60s to the millimeter like using the same screws to bolt things together i mean the 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 detail work is out of this world all they had to all they have to do is completely endorse fan films bring them back to life and say listen you can't profit but we support you and then you know what you have on the streaming services you have the official star trek but then you have then you literally you put the fan films available for everybody you completely endorse it so that everybody can access it in this age of streaming it's not hard to just completely archive everything and well you know the owner of star trek they own the property so they can profit off the fan films you find a way to do it if you find whatever agreement you have to come to so that the owner of the star trek ip can profit off the fan films and the fan films he's you know you like you, you give them enough you basically you make it know. a contest is what you do like george lucas yeah. used to do and yeah, um, yeah that's a good idea and, and, and you, then you the winner gets a prize stuff. but when yeah. you when you enter into that contest they own that video then sure <laughs> that's how that yeah. works and that's and what george I, used to do yeah but at least george yeah. he would find new people to work in lucasfilm through those but anyway sorry cc go that's oh, true point that's true point. You, you you end up with this this, this huge archive of fan created content which they can profit off of and the fans will 
you know, the, the, the best will bubble to the top. And you can also hire those people <laughs> to create great actual, you know, like in-house stuff. And, and it's it, like, it would not take that long. It might take five or 10 years to, to recover the brand, but it would become massive in a short, in short order. They yeah. just have to be willing to do it. No, I agree with a lot of what you're saying there. I, yeah. when it comes to Star Trek, that's probably one of the better ways of going about re you got to kind of just reset everything, reconfigure it, try and find a way to take it back to what it, what it was before. And I say the same thing with TMNT because the beauty of if Warner were to buy it, then that means they could technically make a sequel to the original three films. Can you imagine a last Ronin film that is in the same <laughs> universe oh, as the original TMNT films where you get like, everybody yeah, back action, still alive please. and yeah, do it. yeah, exactly yeah. my point. And you got, I you know, would... Robbie Riss doing the voice of spoilers, oh. Michelangelo and everything like that. Yeah. Robbie I would lose my mind, dude. I, I probably, I did so excited. Probably would accidentally like, destroy my and it would tie uh, so well back to the first film here here, here's 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 the issue uh if we're talking specifically about warners my my first thought is how has warners handled genre material recently and you look at dc you look at wonka you look at all this other stuff and i'm just to be fair i'm not i'm not not saying it's impossible we're about to see yeah we still haven't seen enough yet like we're just starting to get the zaslav stuff you're right wonka is one of the first things he greenlit Besides Joker 2 and Superman and the Batman 2. So until we start seeing some of those things, we don't exactly know yet. Wonka has been, was successful. So yeah, that was, but a, it was a step in the right direction. Yeah, su- successful is different than, was it any good though? <laughs> I, I'm not going to argue that point. Yeah. I, so, I, cause, yeah that, Cause that's one yeah. of those movies that nobody fucking asked for. And the fact that it, it's still playing in theaters while it's out on video yeah, I got to tip the, my the hat thing to is, him on that one. Yeah, if, if Warner's gets if Warner's gets Star Trek and they decide to do a Star Trek movie, the only way they can save the franchise at this point is they have to absolutely hit it out of the park on the first try because Star Trek fans have been. I mean, you know, uh, so Picard season three was a nice comeback, so to speak, but yeah, it was built garbage. on the back of two s- seasons of garbage and a robot. Picard. It was garbage too, though. I don't know yeah. why people like it. But well, I mean, well, as compared to the previous two seasons, that, yeah. it wasn't as garbage. It had enough uh, fan service. I there think it has cause... enough of it for like, you know, how people like the movies, but like the, the, the hardcore fans especially yeah. don't like the next gen movies. Yeah. But I, like, yeah. I think it has that kind of a thing going. I, for I you, loved yeah. 12 Monkeys, the TV show, and yeah, they pulled all of that behind the camera talent over to make that season right well the, the thing same crew just the thing is right beauty from, if it when yeah. when it moves over if it moves over because the other options are things that i've reported before and this is the other thing i'm hearing and that is kurtzman just buys it outright yeah he's, still, otherwise, he's this, still contractually involved in so much yeah stuff. I'd be so the, if he doesn't the beauty of this is if it gets if it gets well if the beauty of it is if it gets bought out that means he gets bought out right that's true, that's true. what we've heard from the start is he's he's either ready to buy it completely and own it under secret hideout as his own company and pull it away from paramount as they sell off the rest of the company. But we're hearing that once they take star Trek out of the equation, that makes a lot of the people that are interested in paramount go, hell, you know, cause that is one of their big crown jewels. Despite the fact that it has been sullied so badly, it is one of those things. Cause you guys are correct. It, it's only a step or two away from being revived in Ninja turtles. Yeah. Like I said, do a last Ronin movie that's a direct sequel to the old TMNT movies. Like I said, it could tie in so brilliantly to the first film with Michelangelo and his avoidance of, you know, being responsible or dealing with loss or anything like that. It would be because you could call back to that shit so well. And like I said, bring back the remaining people that are in the story that are still alive, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, And then on the other side of that, revamp and boot a brand new cartoon aimed towards kids, but much more in the vein of the original 1980s series or the 2000 series. Uh, so you're hitting them on both fronts. You get the adults involved with the revival of, you know, the last Ronin movie with, you know, that it's a direct sequel to the other Ninja Turtle films. And then you have the kids with an, an uh, you know, a cartoon. And then, like I said, with Trek, the beauty of it is you got JJ Abrams and, and Kurtzman out of the fucking way. You bring somebody in who actually gives a shit about the brand, you know, and, and fuck Robert Meyer Burnett would be brilliant or somebody like that, or even Clobby or, um, I don't know if, uh, like who some of the other people that used to work on Trek that you would trust. <laughs> basically. I don't trust, uh, Metallus or yeah. Fuller, Fuller or any what about like clowns? Mark Burnett or any of those guys or, um, 
I love Robert, but he, he sanctioned in Picard season three, so I wouldn't want him anyone. Yeah, well, what is that? Um, I was thinking about Mark Burnett, or who's what is his name? The guy oh, who went Mark over to, or who's the guy who went to Orville? Oh, um, who I'm thinking of. Mark uh, Millar. Oh, is that who I'm thinking? No, no. Not, it's Mark something I thought. Is I know, it Michael um, Kuda? No, no. He's Star Trek archivist, not the designer. No, whoever um, it was I'm thinking of was used to be the main one of the main dudes over on TNG and Deep Space Nine and all that shit. And well, then he totally jumped ship from Trek. Brandon Braga to, did work on the did work that, on that's who I'm thinking of, I think Brandon Braga. Braga's I'm not a big Braga okay, guy. Well, was, I'm just saying, like, I'd say Rick Berman even I uh, better than what okay what we have now. But Rick yeah, Berman anybody like person, that, I guess. Yeah, I mean he's the guy that you know kind of ran Trek after Rodberry ran it until like 2005, and at least he's the kind of guy that was you know mindful of his mistakes and said, yeah, we did we made some stumbles here and there, and he would do better Trek than any of these idiots. He still, and I would say for example, if if he were able to come back or someone like that, even Braga, and I have my problems with Braga, but came back and said, look, we're going to set this the real Trek universe, screw everything 2009 on up, and we're not going to do. Movies, Star Trek doesn't belong in movies. It's a TV show. Movies are a square peg, round hole for Star Trek storytelling. So we'll set a series that takes place <clears throat> about 20 years after the events of Star Trek Nemesis. Crap movie, though it was. Uh, you know, the, after that, and we'll answer some of the questions left by even by Deep Space Nine. And and, and we're gonna but we're gonna set it in that real Trek universe and make a series. It may not be any good. But at least it will be actually legit Trek trying to do something because not everyone loves every iteration of the real Star Trek, which is sixty six through oh five. You don't However, even love every iteration of the real no, Trek. No, but you, I, I acknowledge I it. Know yeah, but I acknowledge sixty six through oh five is legit Trek. Everything after that's yes. not real. That's corporate sl uh, sludge. So I'd say someone with a mind to at least continue the universe that we have not seen since the terrible two thousand two movie Star Trek Nemesis. Um, someone willing to continue that, but like obviously do a future jump like they always do. That's something that, in my opinion, would be the best thing for it and make a TV show. And but they're not gonna ever ask me. So, how can one get rid of uh Kurtzman? Why isn't it simple to get rid of him? Why don't we just make him go away somehow? Yeah, well, for one, he's got this ironclad deal that Moonves put into place, so they couldn't, and yeah. then over the years, he's uh bought into star trek basically so why would anybody allow him to do this how stupid could these people be well let's they're stupid <laughs> and, and not only that and i keep reminding people that hollywood doesn't see people like jj abrams and kurtzman the way we do they're no, finally no. starting oh, yeah. to understand jj abrams yeah jar jar abrams even, is getting out of there yeah finally but even kurtzman is still one of those guys that i got to try to remind people every time we bring it up that when he took on star trek that was basically slumming it for him. He was doing them a favor in their opinion. Cause he's the guy that does all their other prestigious, bigger remakes like Hawaii five Oh and all that shit. He didn't get any crap until he fucked up Clarice. That was mm. when he got on the radar, the big, big people above. And that's when he actually got a bad review and he got that right up in entertainment weekly that were like, Holy shit. Did Doomcock write this? <laughs> it was yeah. bad. It was like, just, it was scathing as fuck and it was the first time anybody had ever called him out on not just one thing that it but star trek and everything else because it was like it was like oh my god it's like i can't believe that one of us didn't write this review it's like these people have been sucking this guy's dick for years and I mean, he fucked up claire reese once and holy shit did they come after him they could give a fuck about what he did to star trek but they really did give a crap about that but that was kind of karma coming back to bite him in the ass if you ask me because that whole thing I'm not going to get into the whole spiel of it all, but if you want to dive into the history of that, it's it was kind of a double fuck you to Brian Fuller in a, in a way of uh, how Kurtzman kind of came in after Brian was ousted. And then, you know, Brian had been trying for years to get the rights to Clarice so he could bring Science of the Lambs into uh, Hannibal. Yeah. There's a whole separation of rights that I can't get into the whole logistics of it. But basically, so yeah, Kurtzman cock blocked that by doing the Clarice show. So it's twice now this guy has come into this guy's life and fucked it up, even though the first time it was vicariously, this time almost felt like a direct attack. Well, it was also, it wasn't, well, Fuller was the original showrunner on. Discovery, exactly. He? But he, yeah, but I so. and that was my question. Cause I actually asked directly to Fuller when he was on Robert Meyer Burnett's channel 
Mm-hmm. I said, what happened or what transpired? I don't remember the exact way I questioned him, but I asked, tried to ask him what happened between you and, but what was the transition between him and, and Kurtzman basically? Cause that's one of the pieces of the puzzles we don't have. Yeah. What he, what he said was there was a patch where basically he was saying is those two never met, right? Like it had one had nothing to do with the other. So he could not answer any of the, so I think I'd asked him how Kurtzman had gotten involved on certain things and he couldn't answer because my hunch is that, okay, I have to structure this like this. Sorry guys. <laughs> my hunch and the missing piece of the puzzle is that Kurtzman came with the Netflix deal or he got the Netflix deal because before that the whole problem was Moonvez couldn't understand how come the show costs so goddamn much. And Brian Fuller tried to explain to him that a, the original star Trek, the first seasons were expensive as fuck because they amortize the rest of the show throughout whatever they built in the first mm-hmm. season. And then throughout, then that's how they make the rest of the seasons a lot cheaper and quicker, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And move is just didn't like that idea, but also he, they wanted the show to look like the JJ movies. Right. And he's like, plus you want the show to look like the JJ movies, which means you're going to have to spend, jj movie kind of money on a show and they balked at that but then all of a sudden kurtzman's running the show and they're spending 10 million dollars an episode it's like hold up time out on scd you mean yeah it's like where all of a sudden is when moonvez outs brian fuller because he was spending too much money or needed too much money to make this show all of a sudden you got guys spending money like water well, he's got the Netflix money. So I'm thinking somewhere in between there, they made the Netflix deal or he came with the Netflix deal because mm. what Fuller said to me is he couldn't answer that question. What he could say is that Herbert's and uh, Berg were running the show after he left. Now, those right. two were the two that got ousted later on for basically being tyrants. I don't know if you heard about this story, but they mm-hmm. were ones that got fired because they were uh, they had tons of accusations by people that worked on the show about how they treated people and such. And they were like a, a, a couple that worked together. Like they were dating or married or whatever. Mm. So yeah. So these two were there in between. So like, okay, so that doesn't help with the situation. So I still haven't got an answer, but that does not dispute my I, theory. I wonder, that, if, wow. I wonder if Curves was in shadow boxing with Fuller's reputation and doing it. Anything you can do, I can do better thing, which is why he did the whole Clary's thing afterwards. And he was the second choice after Fuller for running Star Trek and so on. I wonder if that's not part of the. Mm, could be argument. like he was trying it's to. Personal, but it's more reputational. Yeah, because he did cock block that whole thing in a way, because for the longest time, Brian was in talks with him and Hannibal was a huge success. So it's not oh, like yeah. it's great. It wouldn't, wouldn't have been a good idea for them to. In the big separation, the reason is, is because. Dino De Laurentiis owns the rights to the book, uh, the book, uh, red dragon and Hannibal. Yes. MGM owns the rights to the book. Silence of the lambs. The problem is any character that originates in red dragon, they can't use without permission from Dino De Laurentiis company. (laughs) So it's a (laughs) crazy. Yeah. So it's kind of this oddball thing that they finally got worked out after so many years. That's why it took so fucking long for red dragon to get made. Cause they initially wanted to make that right after the first movie, but Dino played hardball then cause he gave them the rights to Hannibal for nothing, literally nothing. Cause he did not plan on using the character again. Cause Manhunter, the, his version of red dragon didn't really blow up the box office, but it was a cult hit eventually. But at that time, nobody had seen it since it came out. So he just like, whatever, I'm not going to go ahead and use the character, you know? I don't think they paid him a dime, but then after the movie became huge and Anthony Hopkins won the Oscar and all that shit, he's like, well, wait a minute here. I own that character. Yeah. So anything you want to do with that character now I own. So like any merchandising, any rights to anything, anytime you see like, you know, a Hannibal Lecter mug or anything like that shit. Yeah. That goes back to him, not MGM actually. So that was why there was a big deal with the Funko pops for years too. Cause it had nothing to do with Anthony Hopkins. It had everything to do with the rights to the character. <laughs> it's so fucked up. It's like, cause he's all over the place and Hannibal is obviously the draw. So anyway, that being said, thank you so much. Truth hope or uh, SFX uh, 14 saber tooth for that. Uh, and then we got truth, hope, love who had one here from earlier for $10 it 
says, remember when you could say movie is just bad because they're just bad, not because woke politics giggly or jiggly or whatever you want to call mm-hmm. it. People agree is one of the worst in that movie. You would consider anti-gay given the plot. Well, what's funny about that movie was mm-hmm. how much of the plot is similar to chasing Amy. And it had, it had Ben Affleck in it too. But yeah. I'm just surprised that it's the same guy that made scent of a woman. And, uh, I think Beverly Hills cop or something. Martin Isn't Brett? that the no, same guy yeah. that made Jiggly? And I think that was like his last movie he directed or one of his last movies. And yeah. funnily enough, I think the reason that movie came out so horribly is wasn't it J-Law's fault? Well, J-Law's I mean, she fault didn't help. J-Law. She didn't I mean, she help. She is terrible. <laughs> I think her, but no, but I think her people had come in and like taken over the production and rewrote oh, it and all this other shit oh. or something like that. Because that was when I got to remember when she was like huge, not just her ass, but her, oh. her image. <laughs> She did look good in that video where she's in a green bathing suit. <laughs> Goddess of Whim says uh, Scent of Woman is not a good movie. What? I've not seen it in a long time. i got to see it again. I mean, Pacino carries the whole Hoo-ah! thing. Yeah. But, yeah, he, you know. he's good. Pacino makes that movie good. It's not Chris O'Donnell. Well, he's it's Pacino, not Pacino in that too, right? Like He's, he's full yeah. on Pacino. He's Pacino on <laughs> Pacino on chain. <laughs> She had I a feel, great ass, that kind of Pacino. Yeah. I feel like that movie spoiled Pacino, though, because after that movie, he's always acted like in that movie. Uh, it was that and Devil's Advocate. Those were the two movies <laughs> where yeah, Pacino actually Pacino became himself. Pacino. Right? Before that, it was, right. this, is my, this is my family, Kay. That's not me. Well, you see, and again, I, I come back to the idea that I always wonder when one of these really big actors gets on the set, if the director has the cojones to try to direct the actor, if they're a big name versus just like not wanting to insult them like they need to teach them how to act. I always wonder how much of a dynamic that actually affects when you see actors that constantly, quote unquote, play themselves. Is it because they're playing themselves or because the directors just oh, assume they'll just do whatever they're going like to do? Him. And that's fair, Goddess Swim. She just doesn't like him. That's fair. Right. That's totally understandable. Yeah, he was one of the few times where he was a little more subdued. And yeah, you know fair. the one that I think that he's done one of the greatest performances in in a while, and even though he's not even in it that much? Hmm. Once Upon a Time uh, in Hollywood. Yes. But yeah, he, was, oh, yeah. he, he, was like he, was, he wasn't hamming it up. No. He did a great job, and he's and his scene is great. I love it, and you can just watch it. And there's where Danny Vu- fuck you and your dialogue is an important shit. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> what a dumbass comment. All right, Polly, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> it does <laughs> suck. He just, it does Polly suck. Just, that's where he is. Yeah, I like it. Polly just yeah. insinuated. It was nominated comedy. for Best Picture. I keep reminding people. Was it? Uh, uh, it only yes, it was. was. Not, yeah, it, it, it was, didn't deserve but, it. Yeah, it didn't out deserve of obligation. It. Yeah, yeah. I'm not wild about that movie. I'm, I'm kind of <laughs> with Polly on that one. It, it <laughs> has the, the biggest problem with the movie is fucking Coppola's daughter and that whole yes. thing. Outside of that, oh. that's the thing that people, and this is the argument I always get in with Paul, and he's just joshing with me and fucking with me, whatever. But because we always get into this, the thing is, it's funny about that is everybody who's, oh, I hate that movie. But it's like every quote that people pull from Pacino is from that movie. <laughs> There's every good. time I think I'm out. They pull me back in to that <laughs> movie, but overall, as a I whole, killed. it's not a my good mother's movie. son. I killed my mother's son. <laughs> Their biggest mistake with that movie is that they didn't pay Robert Duvall the money that he wanted and they wrote yeah. him out. Agreed. I think that if Robert Duvall was there with him as Tom Hagen, maybe there would be some little bit of legitimacy. I don't here. know if that'd fix it though. No, because there's the still issues. Is, with it. The problem is his daughter. That's number being one in the fucking movie, and yes. the whole fact that they're doing this first cousins doinking thing that is what ruins yes. the movie. <laughs> yes, cousins boinking the daughter and no Tom Hagen that automatically you deduct like 30 points right off the top for the movie. It can't start with well, like, and you can't than- blame Francis for the whole Tom Hagen. That was fucking, um, oh, you just said his name and I just. Robert Duvall. He Ro- wanted it was a Robert Duvall's dollars. fault. He wanted, he wanted too much a million money. dollars. If I'm Robert Duvall and I've been waiting for years for somebody to make this, this stupid movie, and they say we want you to be in it, I also say a million dollars. And you know what? He held out. 
uh, Coppola didn't pay him, and his movie ended up being kind of stinky, which is not You're what you want for a Godfather. In hindsight, but I don't, <laughs> I don't think stinky. that Tom Hagen would have fixed the movie, though. Unfortunately, I think the chemistry between Tom Hagen and uh, and Michael, uh, Michael, it Michael would have given it a little more better. official. You know, I, no, I yeah, it, it would have made it more legitimate. It would have made it more legitimate. You're a not sequel. wrong, but I almost make the argument that you kind of it almost is better that he's not there because then Michael doesn't have him as a fucking safety net. Right, like, because that's the thing about the other movies is that he's got his people there. This is the one time where he's got nobody there to support him but his nephew and his sister. And then as we yeah. get going, and that's what I love about his sister in this movie is she becomes the more darker of the two by the end of the well, film, anyway. Yeah, but wouldn't have been more would have been made much more impact if Tom Hagen had like abandoned Michael in the middle of things and disagreed with him to such a point that there's Maybe. a conflict there. That I, I think it would have been. A, yeah, it would have been a much better thing if he looks at it and says, like, it'd been against the whole, like, uh, because this yeah. is the things I love about the movie is the whole uh, church thing going on, him trying to get out that the, the Zazzo stuff, that scene that that JJ rips off for Star Trek, it's uh, to part Star Trek yeah. 2. Um, Here, here's which is the, thing. the only good scene in that movie where all the important people are in the same room at once and you have the helicopter come up. He stole that scene from Godfather 3. Well, yeah, here, that's here's, that here's scene the, where yeah, yeah they're all together and they all get executed here, here's the element that would have been great to see a dynamic in that movie because with fredo dead Sonny dead and uh don corleone dead michael is his only connection to his family's legacy that was right. there basically since his childhood and so if you have if if uh if he'd take if, if Hagen had taken over the idea of I have to preserve the legacy which I was adopted into, and he's sort of like Michael's memento mori to keep keep himself human and everything else, remember where he comes from and everything, and that conflicts with what Michael wants to do. If you had Hagen, if you had Tom be the ghost of his father's legacy versus what Michael wants to do, that conflict could have been the center of the film, but you will never know. You could be right. And I'm not going to argue that point because we'll never know, like you said, but also you could have gone with a whole idea of if you wanted to have the daughter to be such a big deal. Cause I thought what was the more interesting part of that was that his son didn't want anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, yeah, especially please. considering, and, and that ties back into that scene in part two, where he got pulled away from the fishing trip where Fredo got killed. Right. Mm -hmm. So he always had that question in the back of his mind. And what would have been an interesting twist is if his daughter turned around and she decided she does want to be in the family business but he's mm. adamantly against that mm. and it's not so much that this other guy is related to them in some fucking way it's just the fact that he's got her bamboozled and, and and she's in love with him and she wants you know to be a part of this world right that her father that her father was and his her father's like i'm trying to get the fuck out you know like <laughs> you know kind of thing and your brother don't want nothing to do with it I don't want nothing to do with it anymore. And I think that would have been an interesting thing too. And you could have ended it the same way. Cause that's the whole point is that him losing his daughter is the tragedy of it all. Right. Like they would have rather, he would have rather he'd been the one killed, you know, that's the whole point. But like, again, I think Godfather three is a very complicated film that definitely needs to be observed in different ways. If you haven't seen the, Coda cut, it does help a little bit, but it doesn't take away the problems. Not really? I've watched Not really. all the it, it's, it's I like the, the, the I like the extended cut the best. Then that would be the video version he did years ago, and that was available for the longest of time. And that to me is the best of the bunch. But it does have problems. It does have extremely flaws. But we're talking like on a level of Godfather one is ten out of ten. Godfather two is ten out of ten. To me, Godfather three is like a seven point five or an eight out of ten. Right? Yes. Is it a big huge step down from the other ones? Yes. But is it's it that a, bad? Se no. Seven out of ten. At <laughs> best, as everybody says. At best. And I'll, I'll give you that. But like, to me, it's like, I almost compare it to return of the Jedi. And that's where Paulie gets pissy with me. It's like, no, how can you not? <laughs> They're the same what? fucking that's thing. Return of, the like Jedi return, is a Jedi? Huge return of the Jedi has the thing with the emperor and Darth Vader. It's and not Luke. even an entire story. It it's doesn't, shit happens still, for three parts. The fact that it's in there, may, it redeems the movie. Even yep, if there's um, some nonsense yep, that happens, right, it's so thrilling. That that climactic uh, engagement between the three, and that's an and accident. That's the it, best part about that, and I agree with you. That fight between Vader I'll say and Luke, it. I enjoyed Return of the Jedi, and I like it too. I loved it, especially as a kid. But I'm watching it now as an adult, and I'm going, "This first part doesn't even need to be here, really. Most of it could have been cut. Um, why are we meandering in the fucking Ewok forest for a half hour? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, 
This well, is fucking stupid. We could have cut a half hour out of the movie here. Where's some story? Give me some story. Nothing new happens except for we find out Luke has a sister. That is the I only hate, thing which was garbage, happens. which was terrible. It's the Dude, only thing that happens in the whole movie. <laughs> oh, I hated that movie for 30 same years. Thing. It's the same thing as part one, only worse. <laughs> and the only thing that makes it that much more interesting is that fight between Vader and Luke. And even Lucas didn't even know what to do with it because he had Luke literally underneath. That's because Luke. Gary Kurtz he had him back to the court. Yeah, and he had him backed into a corner and he's like, I can't get Luke to fight Vader. What do I come up with? And that's the moment he came up with the sister shit. So anybody who says, oh, he's been planning this for you. No, he wasn't. No, he didn't. Plan even, I even no, got the wasn't. interview somewhere where he flat out fucking said it wasn't until Return of the Jedi. And he had Luke in a corner, didn't know how to get it out, get him out. So Vader threatened to turn Leia into a fucking uh, to the dark side. And that's what made him fight. But what I love about that scene is nobody ever thinks about it is in that first bit when Vader stops Luke from killing the Emperor. Why? Because that's exactly what darth vader wants why does he stop him because i think subconsciously he's fighting for the soul of his son because he knows that if he kills the emperor and takes his place at his side to leave the galaxy he's gonna be just as bad or worse than he is and this is his moment where he knows that he has to come back and i don't even think george had that in the back of his mind but it works retroactively that way the way the movie plays out because you have him thinking the whole time, you know, he's sitting there going, holy shit. You know, he's watching his son being electrocuted. He finally steps in and does something. I say he stepped in before that by stopping Luke from killing the emperor in the first place. Cause that's what Vader wanted the whole fucking time. You know, between this and your, that, uh, your idea about the millennium Falcon being broken and Chewie and Han fighting over how to fix it. You, you should just do a series of star Wars retroactive theory crafting, but it's true. Ain't it? What did he <laughs> say not, at the end of Empire? Join me, and we will destroy the Emperor and rule the galaxy as father and son. Yes. So why the fuck does the first thing he do stop him from chopping that motherfucker's head off? Well, he's scared that the Emperor is more powerful than both and will fry them both nah, if he doesn't. He's going to get exactly what he wants right there, but it's not what he wants anymore. Ah, he doesn't okay. want to rule the galaxy with his son. He's, well, he's been beaten down. He's a fucking dog. And that's why that, I, I had to concede to Script Doctor on the, as cool as the end of uh, Rogue One is, it is not where Vader is as a character. Oh, no. Rogue One. No, okay, yeah, no. no. He no. is a fucking lap dog now. He basically, whenever fucking, um, what's his face? Uh, uh, um, Tarkin. I just forgot his name. Tarkin, thank you. you whenever Tarkin, Tarkin, whatever Tarkin says, he does. Just, yep, okay, fine. <laughs> when he could just take Tarkin and squeeze him and kill him. That's all he had to do. Fuck you. Like, Vader could do that to everybody. Okay, here's uh, Tom. I'm, I'm being serious here. You need to start a series called From a Certain Point of View, and you need to go yeah. over different parts <laughs> of the Star Wars movies where you I agree. retroactively analyze what could be going on. Point, no, don't, he's don't been don't beaten down by the politics. He's been beaten down by the bureaucracy. He, yeah, not even he Star Wars. He can't do what he fucking yeah. wants. He's sitting here going, I'm second in command, and I can't do shit. I can't do shit. This is what your video fuck? series, Tom. <laughs> yeah. I'm not. I'm not He's even kidding. The yeah. fucker in the galaxy. Now I can't even kill a fucking Jedi. What no, fuck? you make you make a movie <laughs> retrospective series called From a Certain Point of View. Start off with the Star Wars movies and then work your way through other things. Got Man. this fucking little princess bitch talking back to me. What the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> 1983. Can you imagine that ten, 10 years ago that bitch wouldn't have looked at me twice? <laughs> She'd been so scared. She'd have pissed her pants. Here I am, the Lord of the Sith. And I'm like, where the fuck are the plans, bitch? She's like, suck my dick, Mr. Vader. And I had to take it. I had to take it. I couldn't crush her little larynx because, oh, shit, politics. <laughs> take her away. Put her in a prison. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to snap some necks, find out where these fucking plans are, god damn it. I'm sorry, but if somebody come in like Vader did at the end of Rogue One, I'd be like, here, here's the fucking plans. Leave us alone. Just don't kill us. Like, fuck. <laughs> he's killing everybody. Like, fuck. Like, he's so OP'd in that. I'm like, oh, shit, you're right, script. God damn. Why? It's like a video game. <laughs> it works in a video game, but it don't work in reality. Like, if that's the case, then why wasn't Emperor Palpatine just walking through the fucking Jedi palace, just zapping and snapping, just going, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. Because that's the thing with Leota that pissed me off, too, is like, 
How did Yoda go down like such a bitch? That should have been such a hard match for the Palpatine that he escapes like and, and gets away like every sneaky bad guy like Skeletor, right? Like, I'll get you next time, He-Man. <laughs> he flies away. That's what it should have been. It should have been, I'll get you next time we meet, you little green bastard. And he fucking takes off. And Yoda should have had the upper hand. But he knows he only has the upper hand in this fight. He knows they're not going to win the war, so he's got to go hide, right? Like, that makes sense to me. Yoda getting his ass handed to me made my stomach hurt. It made me feel like somebody punched me in the fucking stomach. I'm like, oh, my God, what the fuck is this? Yoda should be mopping the floor with him. He is the most strong. And that's what pissed me off about giving Yoda a lightsaber in the first place. He's above and beyond that. He don't need no fucking lightsaber. He is the guy that will twist your shit, right? <laughs> he just, he just got to look at you funny. You know, that's what I don't get. It's like these guys are supposed to be so powerful, yet the ones that are, aren't and aren't and are. But if you're a woman, you can live through a lightsaber battle and get your fucking uterus stabbed and you're fine. Yeah. So I guess that's the way it works. But if you're gay, you live because you get cut in half. You know, you, you can still live. You just get new legs. And don't tell me that fucking don't tell me Darth Maul's not gay. He is the gayest <laughs> motherfucker in the galaxy. Yeah, Ain't yeah. no yeah, straight he... motherfucker got moves like that. <laughs> well, he was gay for Obi Wan. That's why he came after him all, the, all those years. Tom, Finally, we get need, to reveal ourselves. He's waiting to come this, out of the closet. You need, you need between this and Nic your Nicholas Cage moment to be clipped for two separate videos because you have been on another level tonight. <laughs> He's got the moves like Jagger. Motherfucker knows. Put some <laughs> behind that shit. He's got rhythm. <laughs> now, I know the real guy ain't gay, but you tell me that Darth Maul's gay. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> he's going into weird truck stops tapping on the floor waiting for stormtroopers come on come on There's nothing wrong with that it's his thing <laughs> why do you think he's following daddy palpatine around that's his fucking that's his that's his fucking uh sugar, sugar daddy, daddy. <laughs> Sugar daddy, wow. I want to go out today. I want to go fuck up some Jedi's. <laughs> Come on, you said we're gonna go to the desert. <laughs> <laughs> Can we blow up a planet today, Daddy? Please. <laughs> <laughs> you promised me this huge thing that's supposed to blow up planets. <laughs> it will take some time to build. <sighs> yeah, you know, it's taking forever to do anything except for in bed. Loser. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go fucking Whoa. fuck up some Jedi's. <laughs> <laughs> I quite got on Jen. Guess what? <laughs> I got one lightsaber. <laughs> No, he's got two, two. lightsabers. <laughs> <laughs> the double ended dildo. <laughs> well, he did enjoy penetrating old men. Oh, That's right. I, I, Slowly. <laughs> <laughs> we will reveal ourselves to the Jedi. I'd fuck me. Would you fuck me? Oh, well, good night. All right. Good night, folks. No. <laughs> Goodbye, Hawks horses. They're running on the ships. Goodbye, horses. They're space horses. Can we get some space unicorns? I want one. I got horns, see? I'm horny. Get it? <laughs> I'm putting out a country album. I'm going to call myself Garth Maul. Whoa. His lights are longer. The album is going to be some gave all, some gave all, but I gave half. <sighs> yes. I'll be here all week, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Dooku is such a bitch. You know, you know, I don't know if I want to be bad. I don't want to be good. Bad, good, bad, good. You're bi, bitch. Okay, we get it. Jesus. Holy crap. Oh. <laughs>
He doesn't want to fight me. That's what it was. <laughs> oh. There can only be two. Because Daddy oh. Palpatine won't let us have no fun. You should overdub his character in any movies he's in. Oh, he's, oh. he's in the series a lot. I don't I even watch those. And then my fucking brother. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> My parents always traded on <laughs> there. Oh my. Garth Maul, that's right. I'm a country singer. Some oh. gave all, I gave half. Oh, man. Now let's go take a bubble bath. <laughs> I got those You're kidding, What show am I on anymore? I don't know, but I hope you got your money's worth, Truth, Hope, Love. I did not mean to skip your super chat. We just had not gotten to it yet. And Giggly or Jiggly, uh, yeah, that movie was something else. And I don't know how we got down that path from there. Because <laughs> I've never actually watched Giggly. Oh, man. How did we get from Giggly to, to Gay Mom? Star Wars? I don't know. <laughs> how do you get from Giggly? Every to road Star leads there sooner or later. Well, it was from Godfather Pride. 3 to Return of the Jedi to Star Wars, and I don't know. <laughs> you figured out the, the map, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's six degrees of Nicolas Cage. That's all I know. Right. Uh, Josh Hammond, speaking of Nick Cage, says, Love Tom's Nick Cage impressions. Also, Frank Welker voiced Garfield. Yeah, I was going to bring this up earlier, and I just forgot yeah. about it. Uh, in the 3D animated series, that was a cartoon on uh, on Cartoon Network, also high panel. And yeah, all Frank did was mimic Lorenzo music. He did a decent enough facsimile. I mean, you yeah. can still t- tell it's not Lorenzo music. You can tell it's Frank Welker, but... Yeah. Eh. And I'm still convinced that he eats baby fetuses or something to stay as young as Frank Welker. Yeah. Young. Let me see if we can get a new picture of him. See what he looks like in 2024. Saw him from a <sighs> distance at a con back in January. But... God dang. If this is that, he still looks... Fuck. How does he do it? Mm. He looks the same as he did in the 80s. Who? Frank, Frank Walker. Walker. He just has gray hair. That's all. <laughs> He's the voice <laughs> of uh, like Ray... A lot of he does, like any almost Megatron. any cartoon you've ever seen, he's been in. He was he's the original the best voice Megatron. Of Fred. Yeah, he's Megatron. He does weird voices too. Even just but he's been around forever. Trick. Yeah. How old is he anyway? Oh, we were Frank's got to be in the seventies. Um, I would say yeah, seventy-seven. Yeah. he was pretty young then when he got started because. Must yeah. have been. So remember, he worked. I want to say he worked with Mel Blanc. He worked with Mel Blanc. Did he work? Obviously, with Hannah Barbera. Hannah Barbera's was his big breakout, but Mel he would Blanc, always yeah. do. Because even though I, I remember bringing this up, even though Mel Blanc would usually be the only one to get credit because that was his contract contractual thing. Whenever you had bulls, dogs, yeah, cats, creatures of any kind, that's Frank. He did the bull in the in the famous Bugs Bunny cartoon where he's. Slapping the bull in the face. Frank's doing all the <laughs> stuff. Yeah, that's what he does. Like anytime you need somebody to come mm-hmm. to a dog or a cat, that's Frank. In, in yep. most movies, you'll see it in like, uh, you know, animal voices or something like that. It's always Frank Welker's voice is showing up. So yeah. In Trek He's 3, Star Trek 3, he did uh, Spock uh, wailing in the distance, like when baby Spock was, uh, or young Spock was regenerating on yeah. Genesis. He did a bunch of voices on like Muppet Babies. He's done like almost every Saturday morning cartoon you've ever seen. He did Slimer. He did Ray. Yeah. Um, I wish I knew how to do voices. Tom, you you should be a, you could do it, Tom. Like you have a lot of voices. I can do a Frank Welker. It's not that great, but I've had people actually (laughs) make me do Fred's voice. It's just kind of weird for me, but yeah. Frank, the only voices I can do are Valiant Renegade and WBW Pro. I used to be able to do much better voices than I could. I can Ruggie. do a bad Kermit and uh, kind of Barney or Bullwinkle, depending on how I intone it. I can do Cameron not true on the phone with the principal in uh, Ferris Bueller. It's <laughs> not easy. <laughs> be there you go. Well, it's Jeez, a bucket, 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 bucket. 
I like to speak with Ed Rooney. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Peterson to you. You leave my door at the front door, Rooney. Rooney, pull in my French. Who you are now? You are an asshole. Oh, that's one of the best but parts. Mr. Movie. Peterson to you. <laughs> Maybe I can do Darth Vader. Do okay, it. go for it. Yeah. Starship destroyers are not my concern, Commander. Apology accepted, Captain Nita. I sort of have a deep voice. It's so, it almost yeah, works. Yeah, it works. It fits. <laughs> I mean, you, you had no effects on it either. That was I did. Very good. Yeah, well, that's what I was saying, you know. So if you can do it without the effects, it's like, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll add Darth Vader to my Valiant and WDW Pro impressions. One day I yeah. have to really do, I have to do an impressions for them and see if they like it. Orson Welles is one I've always tried doing. I can't. My best ones, though, probably are like Brando, Arnold. I mean, when Cage. I was younger, I used to be able to do a <laughs> lot of them. I mean, Nick Cage is one of my more. I just did that. Started doing it one day. <laughs> um, I, I mean, my walking is another one I've always Cage. tried to do. The problem with well, people we, like walking and Shatner in here for that. Well, the thing with those guys is so many comedians do them that you end up trying. You end up finding yes. yourself doing the comedian, and that's the problem with Shatner, especially. Especially, is yes. more people are doing what's his face. Uh, so far. That one comedian who always did that, and I can't remember his name now. Captain Jay Pollock. Yes, Jay Pollock. Yeah, Pollock. Because like that, he doesn't sound anything like Shatner. He's just doing. No, the, he's just doing me. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He does like this. He sounds like that. No, yeah, no, Bill, Bill Shatner actually sounds more like this. Especially older Shatner. He's really down, daisily. <laughs> like, you know, Priceline.com. Young, why don't we? Young why don't characters. we do a uh, animation? Oh, oh, I've done them, but they're hard to do. It takes a lot of time. I suck. Yeah, Doomcock does a very good Shatner. That's mm -hmm. true. Yeah, it's good. Yes. You have a lot of voices. Yeah, my. <laughs> I talk this, but I will be by the end of this night. Who wants to take this piece of meat home? <laughs> oh, we get an animated show done, maybe 2D, and you could be the star and I can have a supporting role. <laughs> well, I've been talking to Mr. Berger about doing some things. He's, he knows how to do Ooh. a lot of that stuff. Nice. So, uh, I want a supporting role in the in the animation. Never know. Jason Webster <laughs> sends in five Australian says the difference between STDs and Kurtzman STD is that you can at least get treatments for the effects of the former. Oh, that's correct. <laughs> There's wow. no good point. Oh, that was really good. Sick yeah. burn. Uh, Scott Hughes <laughs> says the cut scene where the emperor's guard attacks Vader furthers the point of Vader is just a dog. Yeah. Enough of this. Vader, yeah. release him as you wish. Which might as well have been fine <laughs> <laughs> all right so this is something that's really deep and i don't i didn't imagine we would take that long on garfield and star wars um so uh we got one more story here that is promised um and i don't know if i'm going to read this myself or i should have somebody else read it so take this with a grain of salt but uh this person here claims that they have the full breakdown of the coyote versus Acme story. So um, here we go. We're going to read this real quick, I guess, as quickly as possible anyway. So take this with a grain of salt. This has been posted on Pastebin. Uh, according to this, and this came from uh, somebody I, I somewhat trust as a source, so I think it might be legit. That's mm -hmm. the only reason I'm sharing with you guys. Otherwise, if I didn't think there was any possibility, I wouldn't. Um, but since Warner Brothers didn't seem interested in releasing it, they write, don't ask where I got this from. Copy and share it while you can repost wherever you like. So according to them, the movie is set in a Roger Rabbit type world where humans and cartoon characters live together. All animated characters are rotoscoped over the live action footage in 2D. Roger Rabbit back in action style. While E. Coyote is silent the entire movie, communicating only in gestures or with signs. The movie starts with a flashback to 1985, a cartoon Peter Lore, and Laurie. specifically Peter Lorre, yeah, 
interferes with Acme assembly line and gets thrown into a portal hole. Uh, hole. Flash forward to present day while Coyote tries one of his usual plans to catch the Roadrunner and predictably fails. He returns dejected to his cave where he has a TV ad for local law firm promising compensation inspired. He catches a bus to Albuquerque. Yeah, I must have taken a long time in Albuquerque. Is he running a better call Saul? Yeah. <laughs> Here we meet our real protagonist, Kevin Avery, Will Forte, of the Avery Jones and Maltese law firm. Get it? <laughs> yep, yeah, Tex Avery, Chuck Jones. Yeah, yeah. Once the ambition goes down... Mo- what? Once an ambitious... Go-getter. Go-getter. Okay, yeah, that's where I screwed up here. Avery has gotten, or has taken the easy path to his career in his career, always taking small cases and settling out of court for small sums and living in a rundown motel. He meets Wiley who puts forward his case intending to sue Acme corporation for damages. In this setting, Acme corporation is one of the largest corp conglomerates implied to be the parent company for several real world corporations. Doritos are specifically named in the screenplay as an Acme product in universe. Okay, so this sounds like this person didn't even see the movie. They just read a screenplay. Um, Avery thinks it's just going to be a small one-on-one sell, one-on-one sell, one-and-done settlement like usual, but Wiley secretly admits or submits hundreds of complaints spanning his entire career <laughs> with the help of Paige Avery, Kevin's young, optimistic niece interning at the firm who idolizes Avery and dreams of becoming a lawyer herself. Uh, the legal complaints get submitted to Buddy Crane, head lawyer for Acme, an old acquaintance of a- Avery, played by John Cena. Mm-hmm. They meet up, and Buddy s- slips Avery a check for $50,000 to drop the case. But Wiley destroys it, intending to push it all the way. Buddy threatens Avery that he's going to do everything in his power to destroy him and his case. Avery, inexperienced and actual court tr- in actual court trials, desperately wants to drop the case. But the firm informs him that Acme's extortion, extort, extortionate legal fees will bankrupt them regardless of whether they proceed or not and decide to move forward expecting to lose horribly either way. Huh. It's kind of funny that a company like Warner Brothers would put out a movie like this. Uh, yeah. Hey, Tom, uh, the I got to trial- split. I'm sorry. I got to take that. Oh, no, no problem. All right. Take care, brother. Yep. Thanks for having me on, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, the trial begins with a no nonsense judge who has patience for any who doesn't who has no patience for any of Wiley's cartoon antics. They humiliate themselves trying to demonstrate faulty nature of acne products. The case seems decided against them already. Wiley stays with Avery in his hotel, uh, constructing implements for some kind of secret plan of his own. Both Avery's firm and Acme attempt to find the Roadrunner and get them as a witness but are unable to make contact. So the Roadrunner is an uh, elusive character here. Let's see. Um, make this bigger so maybe it's easier to read. Um, at Acme headquarters, we meet the head of Acme's animated products department, Foghorn Leghorn, who instructs Buddy to get the case wrapped up ASAP before something is made public at the motel. Avery gets a call from an Acme whistleblower, the voice of Bugs Bunny, who leads him Wiley and page to an asylum of some very, some kind what leads them to a silent of some kind where they find Daffy duck. Avery nice. asks Daffy about Acme causing him to have some kind of mental breakdown. He secretly <laughs> hands Avery a box and seemingly warns him about something before being led away by nurses. As they leave, Avery finds the message. That's all folks painted on his car windscreen before uh, it suddenly gets smashed by a large boulder. Someone wants to cover this up. After fleeing for their lives, they inspect the box and find a strange cartoon paint can inside, which Wiley uses to paint a tunnel on the wall, which they enter inside the tunnel. They find an image of a man pushing a boulder up a hill and a secret message to Daffy mentioning something called Project Sisyphus, but are forced to flee on oncoming train before they can read further. The Acme operative of spying on them is uh, revealed to be an older, bitter Tweety who reports to someone that they know about Project Sisyphus. Sisyphus. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Paige sees this as the potential huge break in the case, but Avery tells her to temper her expectations. They argue, and Paige tells Avery that she used to look up to him, but after seeing how he works, doesn't believe in him anymore. 
He realizes she's right. Avery takes a drive while Wiley and with Wiley and tells him about his backstory, why he wanted to be a lawyer, why he lost his enthusiasm, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Avery went to a top legal school with Buddy. Once he passed the bar and became a lawyer for real, couldn't couldn't win any cases despite being top of his class and grew jaded about his own skill. Wiley takes a car to a canyon edge and makes a show of trying to jump off the cliff to the other side, failing every time, but keeping at it. Avery realizes Wiley's point, never give up no matter how impossible it seems. They return to the hotel room and Avery catches a glimpse of Wiley's real pain. The entire legal suit is all just a ploy to get the roadrunner on the witness stand so Wiley can catch him. Okay. That sounds <laughs> kind of funny. That's a, that's pretty funny. Paige looks into the, good. yeah, it's not horrible, but yeah. Okay. Paige looks into project Sisyphus and finds a lead connecting to the Dr. Lori, as well as an address, con, con, uh, an address connected to him. Avery and Paige head there and they're met by granny, the old woman from the Sylvester and Tweety cartoons. She tells them that she was married to Dr. Lori a long ago. He worked at at me helping develop their animated products line, but became dissatisfied with the work before suddenly disappearing in 1985. Granny tells them that she recently had been receiving messages from an unknown caller that and plays back a voicemail bugs bunny. Avery recognizes the voice and granny leaves the tape or leaves them the tape and they are secretly photographed leaving the house by Acme. Acme legal offices, foghorn leghorn buddy tells Buddy that Avery knows too much and that he is sending the, in the big guns after him. An off-screen off assassin throws a bomb through Paige's window, but they survive the attempt. Playing back the Bugs Bunny tape, Wiley hears something in the background and filters out the sound to uncover a music track playing in the background, which Avery traces to Albuquerque Annual Carrot Festival. Jeez, now this is where it's kind of getting kind of silly. Uh, yeah. Heading to the Carrot Festival grounds, they ent- encounter a shadowy figure he speaks in the Bugs Bunny voice, but it's actually it's not actually Bugs. It's Dr. Lori still alive and speaking through a voice filter. Lori explains the background of the project Sis- Sisyphus in the 80s. Foghorn Leghorn was brought into the Acme Animated Products Department and made numerous changes, beginning dangerous and painful tests on the cartoons. I don't like this anymore. Cartoon characters and objects obey their own comical laws of physics and Project Sisyphus was an initiative of studying harnessing cartoons <laughs> physics in order to improve Acme's human side products at the expense of the cartoons, knowingly put them in danger and faulty products on the market in order to secretly study the results. Wiley's Wiley is on Acme's record as high usage user. Every single one of his failures has been by design. See, now this is where the movie's falling apart and I can see why people weren't interested after discovering the truth about project Sisyphus. Oh, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to say that I think that it's uh, it's becoming too wise ass and too meta. It started off a little even even so it was even as is it was too meta, but maybe a little bit funny. But now it's just kind of annoying. Yeah, like Sisyphus was was uh, you had me there, and now it's starting to to just like get a little bit too complicated for its own good. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm seeing here. It's getting kind of mired in stupidity. Um. Anyway, after discovering the truth about Project Sisyphus, Dr. Lori was captured and imprisoned in a portal hole, which Acme covered up with a story about him and eloping with his secretary decades later. He had managed to escape by sheer luck and is now hiding on the outside before Dr. Lori can tell them anything else. Cars pull up, forcing Avery's crew to run. The next day in court, Avery asks the witness Acme's head of PR about Project Sisyphus. She panics and Buddy secretly hands her eject has her ejected out of the courtroom. Infuriated by the cartoon antics, the judge declares a mistrial and the case dismissed. Avery underrated gives a passionate speech outside the courtroom and to the press publicly denouncing Acme press. This is just stupid. Now when Avery returns to the motel, a huge commotion is outside. Avery finds from page that his speech has become a new, a new sensation and that the case has been escalated to congressional inquiry. With Foghorn Leghorn due to testify, Wiley Coyote wants to go back to his cave home, but Avery convinces him to stick with him and come to congressional hearing, lying that the Roadrunner or lying that the Roadrunner will testify to get him to come. 
In their DC tr- uh, hotel room, Wiley finds out that Avery was lying about the Roadrunner, testifying. They get into a huge argument. Kind of hard to do that without being able to talk, but okay. Avery calls him out for using the case as a plan to catch the Roadrunner, telling him he'll never succeed in catching him. Hurt Wiley storms out. Avery partners, Avery's partners call to tell him that the firm is officially bankrupt. Avery realizes that Wiley, Wiley is gone and goes after him after finding a note in the in his plans showing that Wiley had come to consider him a friend. Aw, this is getting dumb. Uh, Wiley roams the streets of DC and gets lead, led to a trap by Tweety. Leading to a whole comic action sequence chase involving anvils, Magnus, etc. Avery catches up to Wiley, trying to apologize, but why see I don't like having the Looney Tunes play villains. Oh, this sucks. Especially ones yeah, that aren't this... already villains. Yeah, that to yeah, me this... bothers me. I don't this consider Foghorn Leghorn a villain. Um the closest you got to villains are like Yosemite yeah. Sam and, and Elmer uh, Fudd, yeah. Elmer Fudd, basically, yeah. This is Sylvester, almost, almost, but he's even still not. Yeah, uh, he's, yeah. I mean, he's kind of a baddie in some ways, but yeah. Tweety um, being one is dumb. Yeah. See, that to me just feels like they're ripping off the fucking Scooby Doo movie when yes. they when it was ironic to make fucking Scrappy the Scrappy. bad guy because everybody fucking hated him. Nobody hates Tweety. Like, hey, what the is- fuck? <laughs> I know the guy who did that bo- Scrappy's voice in that movie, and he also did a lot of Scooby Watches. And he believe me, he's as bad as the character. I almost just don't even want to keep reading. This is getting so bad. Like, yeah, and I can list. understand why now nobody wanted to buy this piece of shit. This is exactly what I was afraid of: is that the movie sucked. Yep. This is awful. And that's what I'm seeing here: is you can't, and it's, you know what? It's falling right into the trap of what I said. You cannot make a movie on this concept. You can make a skit. Right. But you can't make a fucking movie because what happens when you try to make a movie? You got to have 90 minutes of bullshit that doesn't matter. <laughs> like, no. uh, anyway, you want to keep going with this? There's a little bit more left here. Um, I liked the first yeah. part of it. It was just almost like they, 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 you're right. They needed to make a movie out of it, but they still could have made a movie without making a movie. Oh, out who of do it. we you lose? Know, they could have. Do we lose Clobby? Clobby. Well, maybe it was an internet hiccup. He didn't say he had to go. so He might be back. Mm. Mm-hmm. All right. They're saying finish him uh, in the chat. So uh, <laughs> while he's always the streets, he's led into a trap. Um, Dr. Lori, da, 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 Tweety tells them about how he was abandoned by Dr. Lori before Acme took him <laughs> in. And Avery reveals to him that it's not true. I don't, Dr. I don't Lori need the backstory. It doesn't matter. I know. <laughs> realizing that acme has been lying to him tweety pauses giving them time to escape well here's a, yeah they're trying to make him a, a victim of circumstance but avery crashes into roadworks and gets knocked out when he wakes up wiley is gone wiley angry tries to hitch a ride back to the desert but he sees acme logo and products everywhere and he realizes that he can't give up now avery arrives at the congressional hearing alone in rough shape Con- congressman elmer fudd Leader of the proceedings, yes, really. Let's see the fact that they have to say that. Yeah. Tries to dismiss the hearings due to Wiley's absence, but Avery interrupts, giving another impassioned speech about Wiley's tenacity and how his refusal to give up and never stop hunting the Roadrunner, no matter how what's oh Jesus fucking Christ. Setbacks yeah. have come his way, inspired him to turn his own life around. Wiley, who has secretly entered the room. Here's the whole speech and quietly takes his seat next to Avery. Recess is called. Why? When the fucking guy's there. <laughs> just, just just, keep it on the cartoon level. Uh, I, I like the concept as long as you just keep it as simple as Wiley. They have Coyote not done any of the. Now, here's the thing. Conflict the, with, with Acme. You know, you the get humor into of it like, yeah. is in the courtroom and they've done nothing in the courtroom. We've had like <laughs> hardly any scenes in the courtroom. Like, that's where the absurdity is going to come in, right? And they have just brushed it aside and brushed it aside. And now we're in the congressional hearing of this. It's gone up the... Uh, anyway, and they have a recess. Avery examines Foghorn Leghorn. Her recess is called. Buddy approaches Avery in the bathroom and complains, compliments his speech. Uh, he gives him one last chance to drop the case, handing him a million-dollar check, which Avery rips up, now intending to see it through to the end, win or lose. After the recess, Avery cross-examines Foghorn Leghorn, asking him about Project Sisyphus 
and accusing him of knowingly releasing dangerous faulty products and deliberately causing pain to millions of cartoons. Uh. Foghorn rebukes him uh, in a bitter speech saying that Acme's te- technological advancements and progresses have all been for the greater good. Even if people got hurt, the cartoons are immortal anyway, so it doesn't really matter if they get hurt because it's funny. Who even cares about Wiley Coyote anyway, etc., etc. Avery brings out a surprise witness to prove someone cares about Wiley. It's the Roadrunner. Roadrunner testifies that he is. A... How can he testify? Me, me. <laughs> that he was witness to Wiley's acne related injuries and suffering and shows mm-hmm. that he sees Wiley as a friend asking, are you coming back? Oh, for fuck's sake. Uh, the Roadrunner really does care about why. No, he does. He's trying to eat him. And he enjoys the chase in his own way. Well, he's, he's his foil, but whatever. Wiley finally presented with the opportunity. Getting way too deep with this. Chooses not to. <laughs> yes, and moved. This is why it didn't work, guys. So anybody out there who's going, oh, fuck Warner Brothers. No, more like this is why nobody gave them an offer that was above shit. Yeah. Like the testimony this was, wow. I'm actually glad this didn't come out. Well, and despite terrible. the testimony, Congress dismisses the case. Avery is finished. Buddy and Foghorn gleefully rub their rub in their victory, and Wiley springs his trap, setting off an elaborate Rube Goldberg machine that traps Foghorn in a birdcage. Not a real victory, but a bittersweet parting shot. Avery returns to the law firm, exposing his career to be over, but finds the office swarmed with a huge crowd of cartoons who all wish their press their charges against Acme, inspired by the news coverage of Wiley's case. Tip off from Dr. Lori leads Avery to a cache of videotapes from a project Sisyphus showing proof. See, that's all you needed from the start showing proof of willful negligence yeah. by Acme going back years. Lori returns home to an emotional reunion with granny while Tweety secretly watches remorsefully. So he's a real dude married to a cartoon. That's what it is. I don't get it. Uh, we skip forward a few months. Avery is law firm with page now and full-time member team, full-time member of the team is far from bankrupt, now bigger and better than ever, having become renowned for taking on Acme and other corporations in several cases with cases with federal charges against Acme expected to follow. Avery is happy, file, filled with a renewed sense of purpose. Wiley returns to the desert, having a friendly reunion with the Roadrunner before the chase begins once again. The movie ends with a Where Are They Now card explaining that Foghorn and Buddy are ultimately sentenced and imprisoned in a low-security prison, spending most of their time playing golf. Marvin the Martian takes Foghorn's position as the head of Acme projects or Acme products department. Wiley Cody continues. Wiley Cody continues to chase the Roadrunner. Has never caught him yet, but maybe someday he finally will. Maybe tomorrow. Fade out. Fucking, I can see why they didn't. Nobody wants it. That was horrible. That was horrible. Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah, yeah, yeah that was shit. Uh, Absolute garbage. Oh, I say I'm Sam. insulted, sir. I'm a great general. moments, right? But that is just yeah. This again, I I stand by my whole thing that it would have worked only as a skit and not a. Yeah, I, I'd have got an hour's worth of laughs on people butchering shishifish. No. Sisyphus shish. M- maybe Make making a movie. <laughs> maybe making a movie about Wiley Coyote wasn't such a good idea to begin with. <laughs> Like, why is he the focus of the movie? Because, of course, he is. It's in the day and age now. A title movie doesn't mean anything anymore, especially yeah. if it's named after a character. It don't mean anything anymore. Now it's true. Now it's rounds for the, the, the bait and the switch. Oh, man. Yeah, this that was welcome so back, rough. <laughs> That was rough. Sorry about that. No, you're fine, man. You got out right oh. at the right time. <laughs> we're like going along it's like okay 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 sorry, sorry. okay who, who made this fuck? movie who made this movie for warner who was who was involved in this uh good question i'm looking it up I nobody wants to admit it does this have anything to do with jj abrams it sounds like something that he would, like think of. he would do <laughs> Well, here's the thing. Uh, Dave Green is the director. Okay, Dave Green, who's done that Dave Green guy. No, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just kidding. Earth to Echo, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle sequel, Out of the Shadows. Spider. He worked on Spider Man Three. He worked on. Uh, let's see here. So yeah, he re- directed the worst Ninja Turtle movie ever. So yeah, that, that's all you need to know. There you go. 
Well, he's gonna. Yeah, otherwise, he's got... he hasn't done much of anything. Oh, I predict a big future for him. Oh, I don't. <laughs> In Hollywood, I um, do. Man, are you kidding me? He sounds just the type. James is Gunn he? is one of the writers. What the fuck? Oh uh, well, I'm not surprised That's by that weird. either. He is. He's listed as one of the writers. Sammy Burke, James Gunn, and Jeremy Slater. Mm-hmm. Sammy That's Burke. Well, that's a chick, okay? And she wrote Hunger Games. Oh, she's right up just perfect for this. Yeah. I don't see one comedy in her fucking repertoire here. Or a courtroom drama, for that matter. So she has nothing on her fucking... Like, James Gunn, it should have been funnier than this. Yeah, mm. that's true. Warner Dodge oh, for fuck's sake. You know the other writer, the other guy, Jeremy Slater? He wrote Fantastic Fucking Four. You mean Fan Four Stick or yes. Fan Four Stick? Oh, oh. Night. oh. Now, now night. Yeah. 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 Uh, gentlemen, yeah. I rest oh, my moon night. case. Oh, oh, God. I swear oh. I rest my case. Oh. And he worked home. on the Death Note show, <laughs> too. <laughs> what? And he worked on the Death Note show, too. Oh, oh there you go. I mean, oh. Oh. Oh, yeah, this man. thing is doomed. Mystery why, solved. Why? Yeah, why did anybody think this was going to be a good idea? Yeah. I don't understand. He should, I'm sure he'll be working on the next Marvel Disney project, uh, like uh, the best, uh, like Disney Plus show. I'm sure. She well, Hulk Warner Brothers is two. smart. Yes, and they're just going right. to put out shit Perfect. like Final Destination Seven or Six or whatever. So people, because they know people will actually go see this shit. Final Destination. Not, Bloodlines like, has begun filming. Yeah. It was only one. This movie. is our final story, anyway, at least for now, because we're getting way in the long in the tooth. Sorry about that, CC. Yeah, this is the only other big news movie wise today is that Final Destination 6 is happening. Uh, franchise creator has offered up an intriguing and mysterious tease uh, for the new film, uh, which I'm assuming will probably be up like later this year. Uh-huh. I'd imagine. So there you go. We're getting another Final Destination movie, which I don't hate them. They're, they're, they vary, but That's I would say they were one, one of the. Yeah, I was going to say, they were one of the last original horror films, we, especially in the Scream era that we got. It was like, oh my god, that was refreshing. That wasn't a, a Scream ripoff. Yeah. That's because Glenn Morgan and James Wong did the first one. Wong. From, uh, I like the uh, second one, and the third one was... Better else, uh, like the, well, they did the first one and the third one. I say, first one and third, second and third one are all pretty good. The fourth one is, I think, the one I didn't really care for all that much. Fifth one really sucked, I think. Other than that, I think that's all I remember is that the last two really stunk. <laughs> like, yeah, the first three are actually pretty good considering. And yes, Jay Red Bull, Ray Bull, it's the last horror franchise from New Line Cinema. Yeah. Now old line cinema. Yeah. We got I've been burgled, who's been here for two months and says they all absolutely bomb the later half of the movie if they just keep the courtroom plot line it would have been average good even yeah but see that's what i'm saying is i don't think there's enough of that you can fill out a movie with that's going to keep kids entertained along with adults i think that's part of the problem with this movie is it's skirting the line too much and you know what roger rabbit did they just said fuck it we're going to make it for adults kids will like it if they don't fuck them (laughs) like that was really what it was (laughs) Yeah, you watched that. My mom was so pissed off at that movie. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it too. I can't believe they made this movie for kids. And I'm like, I loved it. (laughs) Oh man, I loved the movie. Why it was for kids? What was wrong with it? Uh, She found it very adult oriented. She was not expecting that. I mean, I'm eight years old when that came out. Like, yeah. Uh, Well, it doesn't necessarily have boobs in it, but you got a hundred boob jokes with. (laughs) <laughs> you know, and not to mention some of the other more risque shit. Oh yeah, yeah. Some I mean, that. especially as an adult, like I didn't get those jokes as a kid. So, like, at least for my mom's sake, I can go, "Mom, look, ninety percent of those jokes over my head." Now, as an adult, I understand what he means when he goes, "I'm a fifty year old stuck in a three year old dinky." <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, nice booby trap. I got that joke. Duh. Mm-hmm. But, like, I didn't get all the jokes, like, dabbling in watercolors, Eddie. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, you know, like, I didn't quite get it. <laughs> I mean, I kind of got it, but I didn't quite get it. You see it as an adult, you're like, oh, shit, patty cake is sex. <laughs> <laughs> is that a gun in your pocket, or are you just happy to see me? Exactly, yes, all those bits, <laughs> all that shit. 
And not only that, look at that scene. Yeah, as a kid, I didn't notice shit. You look at that scene as an adult, looks like he's got a big ass boner. Of course she's saying that. (laughs) You said, is that a rabbit in your pocket, Eddie, or are you just happy to see it? Happy to see it, yeah, because it looks like he's got a huge fucking boner. (laughs) Because he just shoved Roger. Like, Roger Rabbit is fucking brilliant. It is one of those movies that is. One of my all time favorites. So well. And because it was made for adults, I'm able to enjoy it even more now as an adult than I did as a kid. Right. I love all the stuff I loved as a kid. It was just the fun, you know, randomness of a lot of it. But as an adult, I see what it is and the noir story that's going on. And I know, you know, I got the story as a kid. I didn't quite get it the same way I do now, you know, or have for the last 20 years or whatever you want to say. Yeah. Compared to the first 10 years or whatever. So, yeah, no. But uh, yeah, I think that was a big mistake. Just trying to make it into a movie in general. Uh, What's next? Mr. Loghorn goes to Washington. Jason Webster asked. I say I'm just a, a a simple country lawyer, but I do yeah. know a thing or two about the law. <laughs> now they you, tried. A no gentleman. <laughs> they tried it. They kept. They tried to get a sequel made for Roger Rabbit for years, and finally yeah. gave up on it. Thank goodness. Yeah, Spielberg kind of got in the way of it. Some other things got in the way of it. The Warner, they never will come again. To, to I'm surprised they got the deals made for that. Uh, chippendale movie i was really surprised that the hanna-barbera and warner characters that did show up in that um yep that actually made me go well maybe there's a chance but at this point do we really want one (laughs) i mean gary wolf has written a couple sequels and stuff like that and prequels but do we really want one no 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 sir Mm -mm, can't say that we do i mean there's enough stories out there of what the sequel would have been um, and at this point, what, are you, what, what, I don't think it would turn out to be anything better than what we just read now. Unfortunately, okay. it's just modern audiences just couldn't do what they did then. And what would you do? Mm-hmm. I mean, would you modernize it completely bring Roger Rabbit into the complete modern age? Or would you have something takes place in like sixties or, you know, would you just do yeah. something lame, like bring in Eddie's son or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, what would you do? No. I mean, the only other options they had were uh, a prequel, which was about how basically Roger met Jessica and it was during World War II. It was called Toon Patrol or Toon Platoon, Toon Platoon. Mm -hmm. Um, And there it was about him and a bunch of uh, basically an all Toon Platoon that fought in World War II. Interesting story, Mm -hmm. but everybody kind of was like, yeah, it's not quite where we should go with this, right? But the funny part about that one was, is uh, you met, you figured out, you found out who Roger Rabbit's dad was. And that was, of course, Bugs Bunny. Because mm-hmm. um, the end of the movie, it zooms out yeah. like when, uh, with uh, the Duck and Muck episode. And he goes, ain't I a stinker? Yep. <laughs> I think Clobby has to go. Yeah, I'm afraid. Yeah, we're going to wrap it up. We're wrapping her up. So, Clobby, go ahead and start up your. Uh, Thanks, buddy. Your, yeah, we are. Wow, we we're a lot later than I thought. Uh, go ahead and start <laughs> up your uh, plugs. Go ahead. Oh, nothing big. I'm just going to go do a member stream for, um, in, uh, in a few minutes. And then uh, the usual stuff, probably at, at Loki's for the comic book roundtable tomorrow at 7 p.m. And then my wild card show tomorrow night at 9. And the the uh, the wild uh, the clubhouse on Thursday night with uh, number one and great Mark people to see there. And the Chief Engineer and Raquel and uh, with the Blake 7 review and other things on that one. And then uh, on J Man's channel, uh, continue our Frank Miller reviews over there. And then then Saturday Night Star Trek, of course, coming on, you know, and I guess uh, I know that uh, Nick, I'll be on with Nick Friday night, so he can tell you the rest about that one. So anyway, thanks for having me, as always. Sorry about the being late and then the mix up there and the mess up there on my techno thing. Nah, so, it happens, brother. Appreciate it, buddy. No worries. No worries. Yeah. All right. Uh, have fun on your show. Take care. Thank you, buddy. Buddy's on the panel. Thank you. Good to see you guys. Yeah. Good, 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 good. Good, good, good night, Nick, Claude, gonna, uh, I was going to say, Nick, I'll let you go next since I know good you're going to get chat. meeting here. Have a good so. one, my friends. But, Anyways, uh, yeah, this is a fun show to be a part of. It was a little bit of speaking and a whole lot of laughing. and It was well worth every bit of the time. So thank you, Tom, and thank you, Chad, for being here. Uh, Toxic Tuesday will be back next week talking Police Academy. Until then, comic shop talk this Friday. And um, for for the metalheads, because I know there's a few of them in the chat, I'll be reviewing the new Juice Priest for a video and a stream 
Friday as well. Mm. So yeah, of course, TNT Thursday and um, yo, be back here on Thursday as well. So yeah, mm. lots to come basically. Lots to come. Thanks come. for having me, Tom. Good to hang out with you and the dudes. Always, it was always. Very, very fulfilling. <laughs> fulfilling. <That's so> <laughs> Take That's care, buddy. I'm, I'll try and stop it if I can. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for having me, chat. Goodbye. Take Bye. care. What do you got coming up, Price? Um, I think I'll, if I can, I'll do the Quantum Leap review, uh, classic review on Thursday. Um, aside from that, I like I said, I've kind of been traveling, but uh, next week I'll, I'll start right. putting up videos and stuff. All right, we'll look forward to your quantum leap if you don't have to skip it or leap it. <laughs> <laughs> Jason Webster sends in a two Australian it says Elmo Fudd and Street Card named as Iowa Stella Stella. That's right, Sadie. Hello. All right, CC, we got Loki Oki on Friday night, I imagine. That is correct. Loki's Late Show at 8 p.m. Pacific on Loki's Mornings of Mischief. And then we get into karaoke at 10 p.m. Pacific after that. Usually, well, with the three of us, provided that Price is back from his trip. Uh, and I think I should be able to make it. Cool. Well, that's, right. uh, that's, that's karaoke night. Friday it night. It is indeed Friday night. I should be there, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, and myself, uh, you'll probably find me on the morning show next, and we'll probably do some Mead Radio here before too late. So check out Mead Radio as well. So uh, take care of yourself and each other. And Sadie has to go outside. Yes, I know. Yes, I know. Thank you for being here, Jay. Oh, Don't get all upset because Jay's here. You don't have to go out that bad, do you? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> 